Today's guest is a musician, um, an entertainer, and really just a smooth, really just a smooth criminal. Honestly, uh, he's one of the most infectious human beings that I've been around, and I'm grateful for you guys to get to hear his story. Uh, today's guest is Jelly Roll. Bender it is, baby. Uh, the, so the song, what is it? You got... Um, Dead Man Walking. It's the number five song on rock radio. It's called Dead Man Walking. It's fucking crazy. I've never had a song on radio ever. Gang, baby. So, yeah, it's big shit, dude. Is that crazy? It's weird. Yeah. But in a cool way. Oh, you know, yeah. It's like, as a kid, I don't care who you are, especially like my age group, you dream of having a song on the radio. So having one on the radio is like surreal. You know, that is kind of a thing that when you're young, man, and you hear that radio... It always seemed like it was. It would be impossible to get your song to come out of it. I bet. Oh yeah! Imagine being a little white trash kid like me and you, and you're wondering how it's coming through the radio. Anyways, yeah. you're looking around like there's no cord on the car. Yeah. How is <laughs> yeah. this even coming through right now? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, almost like they were sitting inside of your motor and playing for you personally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dude, I used to have a dream that um, that at one point in automobiles they would have a a disc or something you'd put into the dashboard right and then the band they'd have like hologram i always had this vision that right. hologram was really going to pop off <laughs> and the band would come out onto your dashboard the way it would be built and the band would perform right there for right you right there yeah god we should still make that i could be that could make money oh, it'd, it'd make some wrecks yeah, yeah <laughs> sure it first day i smoke a doobie and look over there and see hendrix shredding i'm fucking crashing <laughs> yeah somebody's just somebody's just locked in on wiz khalifa they can't even handle <laughs> no it's cool man so what was that for you for like me as a kid it was like radio was like the thing like you want like as an artist you wanted to have a song on the radio now oh. i have it so what's for you was it like i guess was it did you come up with like the disc comedy era like you wanted a comedy album or was it like comedy central or yeah getting on comedy central was big doing that and um Getting the album out and getting it on the iTunes charts was real big, right. you know. Uh, I remember um, 30 Pounds of Hamster Bones was like my first real album release. And, and that got on to the, like, I think, we've, I think we got to number one at some point, you know, just based on the way the sales go. And so that was pretty wild. Right. Um, but I remember my first, do you remember the first song you ever heard through the radio? Oh, man. Probably not the first song I ever heard through the radio. I know the first like album we went and bought or like cassette tape my sister bought. Yeah. But I can't think of like the first song I heard on the radio. You remember the first song you like remember hearing on the radio? Yeah, I remember I had a, uh, my mom had some, um, some, uh, like babysitters took us to summer camp right so they'd come pick us up in the morning and they would take us and this one lady picked me up i feel like her name was heather but i don't know <laughs> but she picked me up man and she they had bon jovi she had playing mm. and i'd never i think because there was a woman involved also there was like the babysitter and she was like hot and she like had tits and everything right. and so like i i remember it was uh what was um what was one of those bon jovi hits it was uh what was like one of his biggest most popular songs oh fuck dude i just woke up and i'm high oh, that, <laughs> oh never mind. i haven't even ate breakfast and i'm stoned oh, and i'm sitting here with theo talking about bon jovi i'm like fucking this is wild i'm on the radio and theo's telling me about bon jovi and yeah heather. Bro. i would i would like to touch on heather for a second though oh i, I would have liked to as well brother baby i'll tell you that I dude think, i think we all have a first teacher as dudes yeah. that we like mine was my kindergarten teacher I don't remember my first grade teacher, second grade teacher, third, fourth, fifth, none of them. But I remember my kindergarten teacher's name was Ms. Harris. And that is when I knew I liked asses. Yeah. She had the fats, not the flats. I mean, she really? had, boy, that thing, man. 
She had a monkey on her back, dog. I she tell was real you. doubled up, huh? Dude, she had listen, little pants I remember monsters. going home and my brother had to explain to me what I was feeling. I was like, I think you could pop it. I was like, you know, as a kid, I was like, and my brother was like, oh, yeah, you're going to like asses when you're older. Oof. Flew over my head then. Oh, yeah. Later, oh, dude, my wife's got Miss Harris's ass to the T. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> yeah. School's in session. I'll set an apple. I'll put an apple right between them cheeks, baby. For you, it was Heather. For me, it was Miss Harris. Dude, I remember, and she, I would always be like, hey, can I put your seatbelt on for you all the time? We just, <laughs> we'd be in the car, and uh, and I think we had to sit in the back, but I'd be like, can I put your seatbelt on for you? And she would just take it off, and I would like reach across her and oh. just like put that seatbelt on. Oh, I Made me feel so While good. While listening to Bon Jovi. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember. I wish I could remember that song, man. It was, uh, but anyway, it was one of his hits, man. But yeah, for my listeners that don't know about you, man. So how, so you got start. So take me through the story, man. Your story is, is a really inspirational one. And also, you just have this infectious energy, man. I just notice it. Anytime I'm around you, I wish I was you. I'm oh, like, dude. Thank you. That, I feel the same way about you. That guy's having so much fun. <laughs> I like, I want to be that guy. <laughs> right, um, dude, I love you, man. Thank you, brother. Yeah, you bet, man. You got yeah. that tan, man. That's why I'm fucking blowing it. You think? You spraying that thing on, man? Are you laying in the bed or what? Is dude, just I just fucking... went to damn... Uh, <laughs> oh, just... you were fishing? Oh, yeah, I was fishing. I just seen happy belated birthday, by the way. Oh, what thanks, man. What a fucking man. way to spend a birthday, dog. Dude, you're too kind, man. That was with the Jimmy John, by the way? Like, the Jimmy John, Jimmy John? Yeah, dude, we went out there. It was like, we caught... I mean, you go out there and it's night. Like the vessel was damn nice, dude. I got to. It was like Noah was on that bitch. You know what I'm saying? It was damn, dude. They had animals trying to get on fish. Were trying like, damn, that bitch looks nice, dog. You know? You see all these Mexican fish. We're like, hey, old, give us a ride back to freaking Cuba. You know? Like they had fish jumping on that. And panthers were getting on that bitch. They had animals I didn't even know existed out there trying to get in. It was a luxury boat, right? So you're out on there and they had a couple they got like some fishermen like men that are just you know just a couple damn moby dick lurkers out there and them right. bitches they show up and so they put in sometimes if you're in like the deep water they had the, these big electric uh rod and reels on the sides and they would cast those down to like 1500 feet or something so you would just cast them down and then you would see the thing go like that you know right. and so you were pressing these buttons instead of doing reeling oh shit it's like playing an xbox for fishing yeah, yeah it was bro <laughs> that's fucking it nuts. was i mean it was like you could catch the past you could have memories come up somebody pulled up a, a memory of something when you were a kid you're like damn that was deep bro Dude. Yes, so I that wondered, was unbelievable I was, like, I was like is that the real jimmy john that's him baby that sandwich jockey dude he um yeah, that man Turkey Tommed his way into <laughs> You know what's fucked up? I, I look abyss. at you and I get jealous because I'm like, you have all the friends I want but don't need. <laughs> it's like Todd Graves is your homie too from Kane's, oh, right? Yeah. I'm like, I'm already fat. I'd be like, I'd die. If I had your friend list right now, I'd just like live in a house full of sandwiches and fried chicken. You know what I'm, I'm like, he's got every, you're cool with everybody I want to be cool with, but God knows I don't need to be cool yeah, with. I'm got, some of those people I'm not even going to introduce you to, man. Just I've seen, I seen y'all carrying the jimmy john sandwiches yeah. on i was like fuck me in honor of your veins on behalf of your veins i'm gonna say i'm not introducing you to those dogs <laughs> yeah, especially not the chicken man yeah <laughs> oh yeah man i've been pretty lucky and those are the guys that have just come on the podcast and then you kind of get to you know have a relationship with them or right. become friends with them um but that was unbelievable and then there's some points where you get a rod and reel and you're actually doing the fishing you know and it's right. like an industrial size it's like something right. they sell at home depot oh dude i just think about the distance from what looked like where you were at on the boat to the water yeah it wasn't like when you're sitting on like the little you know like the little boat in the bayou you probably used to get on where you just kind of tip your little toe in the water i mean no. it looked like it was a full-blown dive we didn't nobody <laughs> touched the water i was at one point i jumped in for like 30 seconds because yeah. they had some real bad sharks in there and uh but it, you couldn't reach out and touch the boat you gotta oh, touch yeah. the water yeah, you yeah it looked like you were high as fuck yeah you were and then you go inside and you're like in a damn marriott plus or something <laughs> you know God. that bitch is how nice. many days were you were sleeping on the water and everything Thing? yeah you go to sleep out there dude it's like being there. it's like being in somebody's it's like being i feel like in a just like in a damn black lady's womb bro that thing is <laughs> comfortable <laughs> did you sleep good or did the oh, rock and fuck with you did rock, rock you sleep put me out 
I it's like being it. on a bus without the sound of the engine. Oh, yeah. It's, it's like furniture is all made out of Percocet, baby. You fall straight to sleep <laughs> on that shit, son. I was out. And it was his boat? It was Jimmy John's boat? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah it was Jimmy John's boat, man. So that was awesome. He took me. It was my birthday. So he took me out there. And so we, we flew out on Friday uh, straight down to Bahamas. And then we... Uh, jumped on the boat. Yeah, there's some dude like an island guy. Like, you want that uh, roast beef sandwich? Man. They don't even have a Jimmy John for a thousand miles. And some dude standing and the dude's there, just sitting there with Jimmy John, with a box of Jimmy John. Yo, listen, Jimmy John, this is for you. Uh, w- would you please bring back the chicken Caesar wrap? It was fire, <laughs> and it was it was limited time only. And I think the time was too limited, sir. If you'd like to bring it back, man, or use your influence to help your boy, man, it'd mean a lot to me. Yeah, <laughs> we'll see. I'll look, I'll put that word in, baby. I'll send that yeah, yeah. I'll send yeah. that up the ladder yeah, baby. that's the only promo clip I want from the day is me asking Jimmy John <laughs> to bring a discontinued sandwich back hey <laughs> I, I think we could I think we could help I fucking hate you I think we could help man um so how did you find Parker we were just talking off camera about how much yeah, who Parker, Parker McCollum? McCollum, yeah. You know, how does I, Theo find music? That's what I'm really getting at here. Oh, I'll tell right. And then I want to learn about how you got into music, yeah. man. Because I want I really want my audience to know that. And uh I you know what I do, man? I'm on TikTok, man. Yeah. They that's got the way. this uh they got this fella four track that I listen to. I think he's out of South Carolina. Is that the guy you came out to the other night at the comedy club? Yes. Yes, that shit was banging. Yeah, I don't bro. Know who it was. Can you pull it up? See if you can get him on here. <laughs> gang, gang, baby. Hunter more rats, not the gun in the rack. I'm country thugging. Left in the front, squad in the back. I'm country thugging. You better watch out when you're talking loud. Yeah, my cousins. <laughs> Got locked down, I'm popping now. Got country buzzing. Hundred more rats, not the gun in the rack. I'm country thugging. Left in the front, yeah, he's good, squad man. in the back. I'm country thugging. That's good, man. Yeah, yeah. really good. Because I remember the other night when we were at the Shop Show, you you was telling the sound guy, it was like, yeah, play this song. And I think I asked you afterwards. You came out. I was like, "Yo, that song was fire." Who is it? He was like, four track." I was like, w- "How you?" You were like, "I just found him." You were like, "I just like, just, I just found him." That's TikTok. Look, man, when you don't have a family or nothing, bro, you TikTok <laughs> at night by yourself, and you come across a little four yeah, track. Sadly, you know? TikTok's so popular now. You do that when you have a family. Yeah, <laughs> oh, they're, 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 they're sad. Norm, if some nights I lay in the wife of my bed, and we're just watching two separate TikTok feeds. <laughs> you, guys, you guys are just sitting there, just uh, inadvertently. Hooking on Walker Hayes' yeah, TikTok. Yeah, it's true. I'm I just, know. On, it's like hell. I'm just watching Fancy <laughs> like on repeat. Like I'm being, like I'm being, like I'm finally getting punished for my sins of life. Oh, especially <laughs> since they talk about Applebee's. I oh bet they get God, you bent dude. out. Maybe yeah. some of them lyrics. Oh, dude. Um, how do I find music? <laughs> I know, dude. With the Oreo uh, How do I find some music? That's probably how I got a, my, actually my buddy, I was, I was telling you that story. My buddy, uh, Whenever you back in the day when you would just you know ejaculating was a big thing you know <laughs> now it's kind of like all over the place it feels like you know so much pornography back in the day you had to really you know I remember we'd buy a drawing of some cooter or something you know oh, for yeah. the weekend yeah. you know we had this buddy Nick, we had this dude Nicky would sell us a little sketch us a little bit of cooter yeah. for the weekend and we'd take that bitch home on Friday and bring it back on Monday you know because you got two dollars back if you brought it back yeah you had to piece your own magazine together where this oh, guy had yeah. a page from this one and this guy had a page from this one you yeah. take three four pages and tape them together be your own kind of magazine uh, one be a hustler yeah. one be a playboy you know, just it actually that. had th- yarn yeah, keeping yeah, it together you're like this is could. dicey this is my shit but my buddy Scott would put a map up in his car he's riding with his folks one time he puts a map up in the car cause at that age if you start masturbating that's the thing it gets you hooked the devil gets you hooked on your own dick yeah. and you just start bro you sitting there man and my buddy Scott did it by, in a, he was just telling his family where they were going and the whole time he's behind this map uh, just wanking, just, just ruining Maine. Man. That's all he was doing. Bro. And I was, thought I was a gangster because I could pull it sometimes if my cellmate was asleep when I was in jail. <laughs> and even then, I felt pretty sketchy because there was another grown man there. But could you imagine just having a car pull? Dude? <laughs> oh, Your sister's in the, the back risk. seat kicking the seat. Dude, that's it's family feud. Where's yeah, Steve Harvey when that shit's <laughs> going down? Yeah, you know, bring that question up. You over there adding tributaries to your own freaking <laughs> map? Um. 
so take me through man so how do you so how did how did you get into music man how did it start for you when you're coming up where, where does the music hit you first in your life my mother was probably like the sad part of the story is my mother always struggled with uh, mental health issues and addiction and she didn't leave much at all when i was a kid she was a recluse she never really left the house and uh she would like her making it to the kitchen table was kind of like a big deal you know yeah and you'd walk in the house and mom would be at the kitchen table and she'd have a cigarette lit and she'd be sitting on a wood chair indian style right there in the kitchen back when you could smoke it when back when restaurants had smoking sections like oh, smoking yeah. inside places was a thing you know and she'd be there smoking a cigarette and she'd have a record playing and she just have her eyes closed and i just i could tell that the music was doing something to her man like, I just remember watching her and thinking, man, this music's like, whatever that is, is helping her, mm. you know? Or she'd play like Bette Midler, The Rose, and cry. Mm. I could I could still hear in my head, play this at my funeral. And to this day, if you play Bette Midler, The Rose right now, I might tear up. And she'd be like, play this at my funeral, uh, Jelly, play this at my funeral, baby Jason. She'd just smoke a cigarette. And I just remember thinking, man, I want to make people feel the way this makes my mother feel. Mm. That's the songwriting aspect of it, right? That was what ignited the songwriter in me. Now, the influences are cool because I was the baby, right? I was the youngest. How many? Uh, two brothers, one sister, and my sister, who she's still with to this day, was with then. So she's been with this man 30-something years. He mm -hmm. pretty much lived with us from her high school years up. So I say I had three brothers. Two brothers, a brother-in-law that lived with us, and a sister. And we always had some broke cousin on the couch or oh, some yeah. broke family in, you know, in the living room with blow-up mattresses or something. This was just some like... Some future convict. Yeah, this is our current convict or somebody yeah. on the run from the police. I, we had that kind of a house. And... We would like... Yeah, when so, hide-and-go-seek was yeah, hide-and-go-seek. Yeah, yeah. yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you a story about that in a second. It's even better. But when I got in the car with anybody, because I was the baby, I had no fucking control of the radio dial. I was the last motherfucker that got to pick the radio. Oh, station. yeah, and radio, it was so important. You got that in the was car, it. who got to pick the who radio? Who got to pick the radio, right? So it's like when I was in the car, I had one brother that listened to nothing but gangster rap music. Bizzle sitting here is awesome because he's met my whole family. Yeah. Um... We got tour manager Bizzle Gibbons is sitting here yep, in the, yep. in the just, studio. Just and throw him in the middle of our shit. Because looking yeah. at him, like, he's looking over there like, yeah, I met most of them. Yeah. I had one brother named Scott that's the middle older that was a straight gangster rap guy. Like mm. Tupac, Biggie, like gangster gang. The gangst, the more gangster, the better. Well, was he dating white chicks still or how gangster was he? Yeah, I mean, no, he was everywhere. Yeah, oh, he gang, was, he gang. Was, yeah his, his dick didn't discriminate. Oh, he was, damn, he, he was boy. a man. Yeah, he got that Yeah, Biden. for sure. He was all about it all and... And we lived in a super mixed neighborhood anyway, so it was just super common to, you know, like all my brothers had a black best friend or something. It was just so many, you know, whatever. Yeah, same. The neighbors were black. We had a Chinese guy in the neighborhood, oh, a couple damn. of Mexicans. Dude, we had an Iranian family down at the bottom of the street that were super savage, dude. They'd bring Iranian food up, dude, Iraqi food, and it was fucking fire, dude. But anyways, so I'm so fucking high, but... We get in the car and like yeah. all these different radio stations will play. So like, one brother be gangster rap. My sister listened like nothing but Metallica, or Stone Temple Pilots. Yeah, for sure. Like fucking Nirvana when they first yeah. came out. This was all huge. Oh yeah. And then I had another brother listen like super hip hop shit, like Biz Marquee kind of shit, Wu Tang Bunky shit. Cole, you know what Medina. I mean? Yeah. And then Dad would listen to either jazz or back then like singer songwriter stuff, like James Taylor, Jim Croce. Mm. My mother listened to Motown, oldies, and like outlaw country music. Damn. So it's see. like every room I'd walk into or every fucking everywhere I'd go, it'd be some different music playing. So when people are like, dude, you kind of do all kind of music. So I'm like, I'm a fucking human jukebox, man. I grew yeah. up in a, you know, I didn't, I didn't get to pick a music I liked and get to play it because I didn't fucking, you know, everybody else had their genre of music and their world, but me. I didn't have like a place I could go listen to what I wanted right, to listen right, to. So right, I just yeah. had to listen to whatever fucking room I walked in. Yeah, that's funny. The younger brother is kind of you kind of that that ear victim, bro. Yeah, you know, for it's sure. like whatever you kind of you start to get into whatever anybody else is into. That's, that's I never it. thought about that. The older brother really gets to pick the radio and that kind of shapes the younger brother a little bit. <laughs> sure, dude. It's like if my brother's listening to uh Dr. Dre, then I'm all drayed up. I'm buying that for t shirt sure. with the weed. One hundred percent. And when he switches to Nirvana, dude, I'm you know, I'm yeah. 
yeah. cutting my wrist, 100. but not with sharp silverware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't get to get in the car and be like, I really want to listen to 107.5 <laughs> The River. Nobody gave a fuck what I wanted to listen to, you know? Like, we didn't even know you could yeah. talk. i tell you the first cassette tape I ever got given. They, right. I got all these gifts for Christmas, and then they were like, we got one last gift from you, and this is from your bro- this is from your brothers and sisters. And I was like, oh, this is, this is probably going to be the coolest gift ever. And they gave me a little bit of package, and it was a cassette tape, and it was Rex and Effects rump shaker yeah and i was like this is gangster and i remember at that moment it was something that was finally mine because mm. they some mama had bought me a boom box and daddy bought me a boom box but nobody i didn't have nothing to play in it yet yeah so then my brother and they did the coolest thing besides that and then this then they when they handed me the rex and effects tape then they handed me five blank cassette tapes and i said what are these for and they were like we're going to show you how to record songs off the radio you remember this era? Oh, right? yeah, Right, when you put man. the cassette tape in. Listen, for all of y'all that want to know how old I am, I'm that fucking old. Top 10, that when that top would, 10 yeah, came on? Yeah, you'd go to the top 10, and you'd wait and wait for the perfect moment for the song to start, and then you'd hit the play and record yeah. button. You got to get it just, just right. Just right, because you didn't want to hear the radio no. DJ or the skip. You wanted just the song, and you stop right there. Yeah. And you play it for one more second so there was a space between the two songs. God. And then you'd hit it again. Mm. You know, or you'd call and request a song that wasn't popular yet, and you'd have to wait for hours for yeah. them to play it. They're like, who's this donkey? Yeah. And they yeah. taught me that. So I started making like mixed cassette tapes. And I knew I was on to something different then because like I'd get in the car and find out, I got a cassette tape. They're like, we don't care about your cassette tape, but please play it. And it would like go from like rap to something else. And a brother would be like, what the fuck is up? I'd be like, well, Shelby taught me about this song. So everybody so, you know, got happy. So you yeah. really were. You really were like a jukebox. Yeah. Oh, to this day, man, you, you play very few songs that I'm not like, yeah, I know that era. Do you have a body? Do you have balls? Do you have do you have a body with balls on it? Well, our friends at Manscaped, the global leader in below-the-waist hygiene, are turning men's shower dreams into their favorite routine with the all-new Ultra Premium Collection. It's the all-in-one hygiene skin and hair bundle designed to upgrade every day man's shower routine from head to toe your skin hair and balls deserve this save big by going to manscaped.com for 20 percent off and free shipping with code t-h-e-o that's right they have cologne infused ultra premium body wash they have shampoo conditioner deodorant hydrating moisturizer spray lip balm everything they take care of you that's right. And they're using the lawnmower electric trimmer to clean off any unwanted body hair. That's included. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code Theo at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code Theo at manscaped.com. It's time to get wet and clean with your new Manscaped shower routine. Ball up. With more folks hitting the road, more accidents are happening. And insurance rates are going up. Lucky for us, our friends at The Zebra are here to help. They make it easy to save hundreds on car home insurance. Save your money, man. You spend an extra dollar, save them, bro. Don't be an idiot. The Zebra compares home and car quotes from every insurance company. Side by side, giving you all the facts you need to make the right decision. The Zebra saves people an average of $922 a year. You could buy a damn boat with that. Uh, they save on car and home insurance combined. I, dude, last year I would look at my home insurance, my insurance man, I was, I was spending, I can't even tell you how much. Not a ton, but it was like 60 extra dollars a month. And I saved it. Save time and money in minutes. You can do it. Show your support for the show by going to this special URL, thezebra.com slash T-H-E-O, and get your free quote today. That's at thezebra.com slash Theo. So what, so what was the family life like? What was, it, what was it like growing up? Were you guys like, uh, so you had a mom and y'all had a stepdad or no stepdad? No, no, I had a father. Oh, you had yeah, a dad. Best friend in the world. Sweetest dude on earth. He uh, taught me oh, pretty much right. everything Oh, that's right. Buddy was your life. dad, right? Yeah, Buddy was my yeah, dad. Yeah, I've heard He's, stories about him. He is a fucking legend. He really is, dude. Old school, gangster, just laid back. Um, Storyteller, but softly spoken. Didn't talk nearly as much as me, but said a lot more. Mm. And he was old school gangster like that. But uh, dad and mother were together whenever I was younger. They divorced in my earlier teenage years. And... Why'd they divorce, you think? Oh, fuck, dude. You know, frankly, mom. You know, God, I love her to death. Sorry if you're watching this, Birdie. But she... uh, you know, she just she she dealt with so much of her own shit, man. I just I couldn't I, I don't 
who she is now and who she was then are two different people, so I'm sure she won't be offended by this. I couldn't have been with her. Yeah. You know what I mean? Who she was back then. I mean, he was pushing a square through a circle for a long time, you know? Mm. She was really struggling. I mean, I'm talking about a woman that I didn't see not wearing a nightgown for 15 years. Oh, wow. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I don't yeah. have a memory of her being like in a kindergarten thing or, you know what I mean? Like, none of that shit. Damn, so that must have left you feeling almost like, I mean, if your mom wasn't showing up for a lot of stuff, it probably left you feeling kind of unseen or something sometimes for sure some and just, no judgment against your mom look yeah, for my sure. mom struggles with a lot of that and so it's just they went through it so yeah, somebody yeah, did it you know yeah. they went through it yeah and their era you know now that i'm old enough i look back at her and go man she grew up in a house with three other sisters she she grew up with a single mother my mother's 73 years old so if you think about her growing up with a single mother raising four kids mm. she was the town whore in everybody's eyes yeah that's normal now you see a bitch at the grocery store right now with five kids and be like shit i'm she must be from Antioch. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It's yeah. like, you seen it back then. It was like, you fucking whore. You know yeah. what I mean? You yeah. damn yeah. whore. That's what you know. looking for. Yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. you yeah. know, it's like totally different world. So, I mean, I kind of get where she came from. And her, her mother, which was my granny, was just, just fucking mean as a fucking beaver on meth. She was just a fucking, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? She was mean, dude. And I knew that about her. So, you know, I get, I get where, you know, her issues. But, yeah, they had divorced. But Pops was a, Pops ran a meat company for years. He's like, oh, damn. What kind yeah. of meat oh, was dude, it? Oh, dude, we got three generations of meat salesmen. Oh, really? Family. Dude, I can tell you more about a pig than I can tell you about pussy. And damn. I know a little bit about both. And I'm telling you, man, it's just some dude, he was uh, my my grandfather was ran a meat truck called D Ford Sausage Company, and then my father took it over, and it was called D Ford Wholesale Meats. Mm, so and they then, changed LLCs, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Dad got into the wholesale business. You know, my my grandfather was old enough that they actually rode around in a truck and went door to door. This is back when the closest grocery store to a neighborhood was 15, 20 minutes away, and it was a buy rider or CB Smith oh, or yeah. Piggly Wiggly. Or Piggly Wiggly, yeah. This is oh. long before Walmart, so, you know, you probably grew up in an era where the meat trucks came to the neighborhood. Yeah. You know, well, we had, I remember they had a dude who was Schwann's truck or something. Yeah. And this dude would roll through. And this dude honestly was banging some ladies, bro. This, I, I don't know how this guy was a real Casanova, bro. You <laughs> know what dude. I'm saying? He would, and the second he saw the kids, he'd be all pissed and stuff. You could tell. But, um, he was, yeah, they had everything in there, fro like frozen things of cookies and, uh, beef. He had the beef area. He had to get in the beef area. Yeah. Uh, the beef area, I remember when you opened that bitch up, it was like, oh, yeah, all the, the it was so cold in there as a child, you couldn't even look in there for long. You was no. afraid to even look at the beef. Yeah. And then he, they, they came through with the little Chinese food portal at one point, and that's when I think the people I was living with at the time they cut it off, man. They said, We're not doing all of that, shit. yeah. Well, at that point, it wasn't far away from being food trucks in that era, but yeah, yeah it was like an early food yeah, truck, but you yeah. had to cook it, yeah, for sure. No, but you had. Big Buford, my grandfather would just pull up with a, and he did nothing but pork. It was just sausage. It was a D Ford sausage company. It was a family recipe. We still have it to this day. And uh, my father was entrepreneurial, so he was like, I want to sell more than pork. So he got into poultry and beef oh, damn. as well. And he was like, instead of taking it door to door, change with the times, I'm not just going to service door to door in the small piggly wigglies and buy rights. I'm going to start going to local barbecue pits and local restaurants that were local owned and local red. And, you know, he was a, he sold meat that way and, and, and housed his own meat. My brother now, my oldest brother, the one that was more of a hip hop head, um, he, he still is does still meat? in the meat business. Oh, yeah, damn. he's still in the meat Y'all business still to this doing day. Meat. Yeah. Mm. Oh, dude, it's still you know, and it tickles me pink because it's like my dad's still here. I go hang out with my brother and all his meat salesman friends. Yeah. And it's funny how that business is generational that way because most of them guys you'll meet. Daddy was in the meat business. You know, I hung a lot out of businesses guy. are. Yeah, it's crazy. A lot of the police officers, boat yeah. captains, a lot of things are. Sure. Uh, it just comes down through the family line. I um, was the only one that had a vision outside of anything like that my other brother ended up doing a uh survey he's a land surveyor uh and does all that kind of stuff oh, damn. he's like uh into like engineering and stuff mm. civil engineering yeah i got I actually got my degree in urban planning bro um in urban planning yeah i'm, okay. I'm a uh I'm an urban planner, I guess. I mean, I am. I'm, I don't know. I don't know if I'm, my license is active or whatever. I don't know if I ever got a license, but I am. I guess I'm legally an urban planner. I guess. I mean, I got the. You know, yeah. I did it. I, yeah. You know, I think it's mostly about. I mean, I know what it's about. It's about 
neighborhoods like if you have to have like uh say you're putting together a neighborhood and somebody needs you need to know where the post box post office box is going or like if a mail truck is coming through how to get it through like the you know give it the best directions right right uh yeah he deals with the like like, uh can you build here is this a flood land or you know shit like that and but yeah, I'm the only one that even took to like something artist driven or creative minded at all. So when did it start to like really take shape or something? Or what do you think kind of, did you have some pitfalls or something? Like what was it like in your teen years growing up? Cause I know you got into some trouble, right? Yeah, yeah, I got into a little trouble. So the other side of my father that was the side that I seen the most more than the hard work and salesman was, he was a hustler. Yeah. So my father booked bets on the side most of his life. You know, it's part of, part of a story that he didn't tell because later in life he went on to marry a fucking Methodist minister and totally different dude than the dude I grew up with you know which I love both versions of him but I grew up with the old gangster that booked bets you know I, I grew up on a bar stool with him booking bets and and what bets on anything football game all kind of well, stuff well he ran like the old school football cards yeah I remember so he that. wasn't just like a gambler he was the dude who booked them so we, he'd drop off football cards to like Stanley Street Bar and Larry's and Antioch and TGI Friday's and Antioch when it first opened up and like all these local bars he would run football cards through them and he'd, he'd, he'd take phone bets two parlays and you know flat and I remember flat the card I remember my buddy's dad worked over at like uh, a Ford dealership right mm-hmm. and he'd come home sometimes he'd give us a car you know we could you know we put four, five six dollars on it or something yeah. that's when five oh, or six no, dollars was, it was a, a lot big deal yeah. you know, especially for you just to be guessing if it's going to work and you know he made a deal with all of us brothers when we were younger that you know he said I'll give you a choice I'll either pay you per football card that you put out or I won't pay you per football card and I'll let you share in the revenue of it. So his thing was like, either you can take this risk and make more money with me or I'll just give you a flat fee for every, you know, X amount of dollars per football card you put in the streets. Mm. So he kind of taught us that work ethic and it was fun to watch the brothers because you have some that played it safe, you know, and then you had the me's and that's when he knew something was going to be different. You got risky. Me and another brother, we had some cousins that played it safe. Me and all the brothers went for the risky. Y'all risky. Me and all brothers were like, nah, fuck that. We're going for it. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're putting it all on the line. We're trying to upsell people on bets, you know, and trying to figure it out. So I always had that hustler in me. And then when mom and dad divorced, I stayed with mama. You know what I'm saying? Because I felt like she was the one that needed me. Yeah. But, you know, in hindsight, as a kid, I should have never, you know, I should have went with where... I should have went with what I needed, not what I thought somebody else needed. But but that I, just know, shows your mama. nature as a human, probably. Yeah, yeah, you know? for sure. I love my mom. I thought my mama needed me, so I was like, okay, now I got to be the. And I didn't learn enough about football. I didn't, you know, who's I was fucking fourteen, like fifteen, sixteen years old. I can't go book bets. Yeah, so fuck I was like, the well, Jets. Just, That's yeah, what most yeah, people know, right? Yeah, it's like I'll just fucking, you know, I'll I'll go, you know. Whatever, I'll just go find alternate means of money, and for that it was you know drugs, and drugs normally lead to robbing, and you know just goofy shit as a kid I just got in a lot of trouble I ended up in juvenile for a lot of years and the juvenile years rolled over because I went to juvenile you know I think the first time when I was like 13 or 14 and just kind of went to that revolving door ended up in yeah. juvenile penitentiary ended up in group homes kept running from them what was that penitentiary like was it pretty what, anything you miss about it dude no the fuck no man I tell people all the time jail prison all that stuff dude is when people are like i love when dudes are like we just i just talked to uncle joey about this mm-hmm. old joey coco yeah and we were Talk talking about how up. some dudes go to prison enough that they start talking about them like they're malls <laughs> you know what i mean like yeah that one was actually had really good food and yo you know that one had the prettiest guards and i'm like this ain't yeah. a fucking mall they all sucked that one had you an american like, eagle like yeah. my best memory in jail sucks compared to my worst memory at home you know what i'm saying like when you're like what was the best day you ever had in jail it's like i came back and the whole unit threw me a birthday party i was uh, working in the kitchen and i came in and everybody had like put all their snacks together and they'd set up a big jelly roll birthday party because i was going home soon so it's like a going away birthday party and as as much as my soul was touched for all these fucking gangbangers and criminals to celebrate me it sucked. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, it's like the worst birthday I've ever had at home. Yeah. Fucking swapped that one. You know what I'm saying? Google surprise party in prison and see what comes up. Yes. I didn't want to get an image in my head. Uh, and did they have any, uh, let's get a couple images there. Let's see some. Yeah, let's see if this even pops up. Let's see. Oh, there's probably a band called it. I'm yeah, sure no. there is. That's oh. the problem nowadays. You Google anything and there's some shitty band named after it. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, we're not getting much. 
No, if we, we didn't oh, have camera cake. phones in there. At oh, the here's time. a cake right there. Click on that cake. Yeah, happy birthday, Jamal. Now, imagine if somebody oh, made... Just said, <laughs> Yo, Jamal, happy birthday. Yeah, yeah. You know, the best part of that is if they would have made that out of honey buns, it'd be realistic, right? Oh, That'd yeah. That'd be some stuff, because, you know, you get a cantina in there and stuff. Oh, because y'all had to make bootleg cakes, huh? Yeah, oh, dude. Look, but I tell you what, because of that, my fat ass can whip, boy. I can, really? I, can, I can make something out of next to nothing. Now, so you'd be in there. Like, where? what was your space in the penitentiary environment? What what, what kind of guy were you? Were you just kind of the guy making everybody laugh? Were you the... Were you kind of a hard header what kind of no nah, dude i was just dude I, I guess i probably made people laugh and entertain we did freestyle fridays and i worked in the kitchen and you know yeah i was just there dude my young juvenile years i was more of a hard head because i was the only white guy there and i felt like i had a point to prove so i was yeah. you know whatever and did they but ever then, let you say the n-word or not uh you know what's crazy is that is a word in which context, right? Because there's one way in which you're never allowed to say it, right? No matter yeah. what, yeah, yeah. And then in the like other that. way, you know, there's certain white guys that, yeah, for sure, in different different penitentiaries and prisons and jails. Every now and, and then, stuff. somebody, yeah, there's yeah, a for cool sure. black I'm guy just, that like yeah, lets you get sure. away with it. Yeah, for sure, they'll let you get away with it. Just you know, you just want to make sure you don't have a neighbor recording you or nothing. You know, yeah, that stuff will stick with you. But you know <laughs> yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, Shout out to our boy, but no, I'm just joking. Yeah. I love you, Bubba. But you know, it's like you want to make sure that. Yeah, no, they don't, you know, it's different, man. And it's also different per jail. Every jail and every prison and everything has a different structure. You know, it gets way more racist in federal prison than in state prison. And it's especially like county jails is a totally different world because you know everybody. Yeah. When you go to the county jail, there's like a degree of separation between you and everybody in the county jail. Oh, wow. Yeah, because you know, it's all, it's local. That's it's all point. local. Like worst case scenario, you're from North Nashville. We're two minutes away from me dropping somebody's name in North Nashville that we both know. Yeah. You know what I mean? The other problem with that is it's a lot of real drama in there, though. Like where guys have been like, I have been waiting to run into you because oh. you had a problem with my cousin. Oh. And, you know, whatever year. Yeah. So, you know. Oh, yeah. That's really that's really the uh, that's the real confluence yeah. of the local yeah. bullshit. Yeah. Where it's like in the federal scale, there's no way me and a dude in Wisconsin ever have a personal problem with each other. Right. Right. Where, right. Where, you know, in the county jail, I had a lot of personal problems with people. And know? what about a lot of gays in there? Any, any type of activity like that? A lot of gay activity? Or was that? Is when that... you get to like prison, prison, you start having dudes that are, you know, bust her butt open yeah but the county jail that's not happening i spent more time in the county jail than the big prison so yeah because i was more of a revolving door kind of criminal mm -hmm. go for a year or two come home go for a year or two come home you know oh, i'm yeah. just like a i was that guy yeah I like was, a, oh he's back you know what i'm saying that was like somebody that winters in florida like that kind yeah, of yeah exactly fucking totally right like a guy that goes to losers you know once every two weeks or winners oh or yeah red i was a red door kind of guy you know it's like i was just always oh, back you know and yeah, those are local bars people don't know that yeah 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 oh yeah sorry um super nashville talk y'all <laughs> so what about uh so when so when you kind of got when music kind of got kind of took over your life did that have an effect like tell me kind of how you got how did you get into the music then i was just i started writing raps young just because I didn't think I had a cool voice to sing, you know, and nobody in the family sang to teach me to sing. So I would write like raps. And that was obviously like, I, I don't know how much of that we caught earlier, but that was the language of the community. Hip hop was the language of the neighborhood. You know, yeah. it was a super mixed community. I grew up like you. You know what I'm saying? Like a super Well, it always mixed is a community. poor neighborhood, man. It's really, because black it, shit is cool usually. So For it's sure. like black shit always is the cool shit. Right, 100%. Yeah. No, it's, to this day, hip hop has influenced every genre of music on earth, whether people want to admit it or not. I hear it the most in country music. Yeah. Country, I mean, I hear hip hop melodies, hip hop drums, 808s. That is just so prevalent in country music. But, you know, hip hop was the language of the community. So that was kind of what I got into first. And I'd freestyle at tables and in juvenile, I'd freestyle battle people. And I tell this story, it's my favorite story to tell about my father. I was going, getting bound over as a juvenile and charged as an adult. I had made a decision as a child that they warranted me being charged as an adult. And I ended up with that felony on my record for a crime I committed at 16. To this day, I can't get rid of that felony. And when they bound me over, the only good thing that happened was I got a bond. Mm. I'm 17 years old. I'm going to the county jail. They let me call one person when I get to the county jail. And who was it? Pops. 100% of the time, I'm calling my dad. I'm calling And he buddy. answered? One, man, that was my guy. The dude supported me more than, I can tell you buddy stories till I'm blue in the face. He, he was the most supportive dude of my wild shit of anybody. When I wanted to quit music, 
probably six years, five, six years ago, I sat down with him for seven years ago and I was like, Pops, I'm just, I'm not, it's not going to work. I was sitting at the tin roof, a bar right on the Mummery Street that they have a plaque with his name in there. He was a legend at this spot. Yeah, this and, is in uh, Nashville. Yeah, this is a super beautiful spot right on the Mummery. You ever come through, swing through. And uh, they serve everything out of plastic. It's I would say great. beautiful is not the term I would use for it, but it is a good spot. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> the higher floors you go, it gets extremely sticky until you get, you can't even leave, I don't think, the fourth yeah. floor. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're talking about the Broadway one, though. Oh, yeah. I'm, thinking I'm old school OG Demumbrian, right? Oh, okay. I'm still Never the one mind, that's right man. there. In the, yeah. Oh, yeah. That yeah. one is nice. Yeah, and everything served out of plastic, which was fucking what my dad thought was the greatest because he'd take a drink to go with them every day. You believe in stem cells? I don't know anything about them, dude. Hell, you're, you, you be way beyond my pay grade of intelligence at this point. I, mean, I want to get hair plugs. Is that close to the same thing or not? No, you're doing, uh, <laughs> no, you're doing fine, I think, on the hair, man. I'm uh, hurting up, uh, up. Listen, man, my fear in life is balding. Is it? I can't be fat and bald. Oh, you know what I'm on, saying? Man. Dude, I listen, it, dog, when you're fat, you got to pick struggles very intelligently, Theo. Really? Yeah, man. I don't get to be, you know, you can have a kind of a smelly day and get away with it because you're an old handsome fucker. Not me. Damn. If I'm fat and smelly, it sticks forever. I got to make sure I am smelling That's my true, best. Huh? Yeah. If you wake up and forget deodorant, you're like, oh, a little musty. I wake up and forget deodorant. That'll log. That's a damn ecosystem, it. huh? Oh, <laughs> dude. It, I will, it will follow me like pig pen. Oh, you'll have on moss Charlie on the Brown. north side yeah, by afternoon. I can't yeah, afford, I, I can't be fat and bald, damn. man. Yeah. Yeah, because you're a bigger guy, man. What's it like being bigger? Well, you got to make sure every chair won't hurt you or break you. You look That's first, the biggest huh? Thing. Well, you've got to give it a test. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. For sure. You got to ease into it. Yeah, huh? man. Damn, I don't think about that kind of stuff. And were you always a big guy since you were young? Yeah, dude. I was fat as a kid, man. I've just always struggled with like, and I think it's a part of my my personal mental health struggles, right? We all have our own things and our own demons yeah. and vices. And for me, I could literally go on a three-day cocaine bender right now and wake up on the fourth day and be like, well, that was a lot of fun and not do it again for weeks or months, you know? But, dude, you fucking set some snacks out somewhere and don't let me hover around them more than two or three minutes. I'll start filling my pockets up like I'm in jail and I'm wow. never going to see them again. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, for sure. You want them snacks, yeah. Yeah, I'm all about the snacks. Do you... um? Does it scare you your way? Does it worry you? Yeah, all the time, dude. I don't want to be this fat. Hell, I don't want people commenting on, he's going to die. It's going to happen for sure. You know what I mean? Oh, like, damn, fuck, bro. Dude, I mean, it surprised. might be me writing it, yeah, too, bro. Right? Yeah. Like, I got a couple uh, yeah. ghost accounts. A couple of ghost yeah. accounts. You know, it's like, you don't want to go through that. And yeah. I'm on the, I got a nutritionist now. And I've been working on working on my weight this year more than I have in a long time. But I also don't worry about it as much as I should because I've been on this roller coaster my whole life where I'm a little more plump right now, but I can show you pictures when I was less plump and I can show you pictures when I was more plump. I just kind of, you know, it's kind of part of what I, what I deal with, just trying to get on the other side of the mountain. Do you feel like, um, well, what, two questions. Have you ever tried any of like, cause I know they do a lot of those surgeries and stuff. Have you ever done anything like that where they like get into your system or whatever? Yeah, I'm just not with that. Don't, you know, I'm not gonna, I don't know, man. Don't fuck, I don't wanna get cut on and all that old shit. And, yeah. I yeah, know, I just don't man. know what people do, you know? It. You know what the most selfish thing I can say right now is, but it's real? I've heard when you do the surgery, it fucks with your ability to intake anything, which I would love for that to be the case with food. But like, they were like, well, you can't drink more than a half gallon of water a day on or it'll make you sick. What? Like, I don't want to spend oh, my God. life. I'd rather die young. Yeah. Not young like this, but like, you know. Then having to measure your water as you drink Then have to it. measure my water. You know what I'm saying? Then yeah. Like, just I little didn't know stuff. All like, that. yeah, when they started explaining some of the stuff to me, because I went and talked to the dude. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, there's, no, there's not a fat person on earth that can afford the surgery that hasn't at least went and talked to the person about the surgery. Yeah. You know, and when he started explaining it to me, I was just like, and he was honest enough too. He's like, look, man. I think that if you just put your mind to it, you'll lose the weight again. It's been proven that you can lose the weight. What hasn't been proven is that I can keep the weight off. Mm. So that's what we got to figure out next. That's such a struggle for so many people, man. You know, I, I, I don't know what that's like. I know what a struggle is like, but I don't know what that struggle is like. Do you feel, though, also you're so recognizable as this, like, larger-than-life character? Do you feel like being larger, you almost have to be larger? No, dude. It's like I think the real side of it is it's a decision to live. And I'm just starting to make that decision. Mm. I spent most of my life. Oh, yeah, not giving a fuck if I live or not. Just not giving yeah. a fuck. 
I feel you know that, what I mean? bro. Like, yeah. I tell people to this day, like when I really start to get angry, I have to. I've had to have this moment with a few grown men in my life where I'm like, dog, do I look like somebody that cares? Like, you should really assess that before you talk to me crazy. Like, <laughs> I have everything written on my body to show you I don't give a fuck about a lot. You know what I mean? And it's like, I'm just starting to give a fuck. Like, I'm just looking at my 14-year-old daughter like, I used to be like, if I could just live till she's 18, I'd be okay. Now I'm starting to be like, I'd like to meet my grandkids, I think. Yeah. You know, it's like you're starting to think about shit you didn't think about before. Isn't that kind of magical when those ideas come in your head yeah. that think make you believe you care about yourself? Yes. That's, that's insane. It's little stuff that's like, I think I do want to meet my grandchildren. Yeah. So that's what made me hire a nutritionist. Before, it was like a chore to be like, I just want to stay alive till she's 18 so I don't create any un more unnecessary trauma in her life. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then it's like... You know, it was about her. And then it's kind of like selfishly now it's about me. It's like, I don't know, man. I kind of want to hang out with the grandkids. I kind of want to kind of want to see where this thing ends up with her. Yeah. You I want to see what jelly. Yeah. When jelly starts to kind of coagulate, I want to be there. Yeah, for sure. I want to kind of look because like now she's cool enough at 14 that I'm like, dude, I bet she's going to kick ass at 25. I, I want to see that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, dude, she's going to be a whole different human at 35. Fuck. I didn't know my ear from my asshole at 25. Wait till she's 35. I'm like, fuck. Now I got to live for 30 years, not 20. You know what I mean? Me. like oh god damn, I need to damn i'm gonna have to fucking stay yeah. alive i'm gonna have to do a push-up or something yeah. you know what i'm saying Fuck. what uh how'd you get banana. the child oh dude complete accident really yeah man for sure Never and was it like a one night stand deal or were you no, in no, love i was on and off with the girl for a long time man uh uh, well, until i one of the one of my cycles of jail i had bailey when i was in jail okay you know what I mean? Was kind of my thing. So, and did you? Uh, was it your first girlfriend? Was it? Was she the mother of the of the child? Yeah, well, not my first girlfriend, but you know, or one of my earlier, earlier girlfriends. Believe it or not, to be a big fella, I've always fancied myself with women. Yeah, I've well, always, your, you know, <laughs> your wife is a real. Your wife got them hammers on her, Yo, baby. She man, got them I'm damn fucking you, she got, front yams, man, baby. She got them. Dog, she is a stacked deck mm. and she is a fucking sweetheart of a woman My God. and she's a fucking pit bull when she needs to be i married a full-blown wow. german shepherd <laughs> you know what I'm yeah, yeah, so yeah she she mixes the pot perfectly but i've always and my, my wife tells people this is like i love it when she gets with people one they're like she she's a gold digger like i was piss broke when i met bunny she financially supported me for years yeah Two and Bunny is his wife's name. Yeah, but, and, and, and Bunny got them rabbits yeah, too. Yeah, I'll tell you that, sure. boy. Bunny you know what I'm saying? Yep, yep, Mr. Yep. McGregor's garden yeah, for son. Sure. Motherfucker want to give her the carrot. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> she's, <laughs> but and then she'll tell people too, like, dude, I'm not the first bad bitch my husband's ever fucked. Yeah. Like, she's the first person to tell people, like, I've always fancied, you know, a good conversation with a nice lady. Yeah. So that wasn't shit. Yeah. So the girl I had a kid with wasn't my first one. She was just the first one that the pull-out technique didn't work with. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Damn. I got a son, too. He's almost six. Oh, really? With the bunny? No, nah, no, nah, yeah, not different relationship. Hey, they kind of coincided there, but uh, I just, I... This girl was pregnant. We wasn't together, and I didn't really know much about the situation with the pregnancy. Like, you know, whatever. Yeah. I knew she was pregnant, and I knew it was mine, but we wasn't together at the time she got pregnant, and me and Bunny started courting each other, and yeah. it's a longer story, but yeah. yeah. It's not my favorite story to tell, but yeah, I got a son, too, and he's cool as fuck. What about that first girlfriend? You remember that one? Or first kiss? Take me there, man. Take me on a little bit of that adventure. Oh, dude, it was the girl across the street. Who it was yours? It always is that was yours girl across the street, too? Mm, I... <clears throat> I think it was, dude. They had this girl across the street from me that had that Lloyd Christmas on her, bro. She was chipped out. You know what I'm oh, saying? Oh, dude. She had that sand wedge right there. A little shit on that, like that's kind of cute, though, right? That, oh, I yeah. thought it was. I'd never seen it. Yeah. You know, it was just damn <laughs> beautiful. Her tooth had that damn cowlick, you know? Right. And, uh, and some people locked us in a room, some adults and, you know, perverts, really. And they were, like, watching through the door and yelling, kiss and fuck. You know? no. <laughs> and we didn't know anything about it, man. You know, and she was the cutest girl. Chrissy was her name, and she. We ended up, so we just kissed. You know, Chrissy. Like, I think that was my first kiss, and then there was another time this beautiful girl we were playing spin the bottle dude and i don't even know i i was so scared to even sit at this circle i was sitting we we're sitting in the circle 
And for years, I remember thinking we were sitting around a fire, and then I just remembered that's how scared I was. Oh. I felt like there was a fire in front of me because some there was a chance there could be a kiss. You yes. Know? And this girl named Emily, man, the bottle stopped on her, and I always thought like somewhere like in the last uh, chasm or whatever of my heart that she cared, thought thought about me mm. or thought you know thought I was you know a try or whatever I don't know. And she got to pick whoever she wanted in the circle, dude. And she came over to me and fucking the fire got, you know, people were throwing logs on the fire. And I'm just so scared. And I remembered seeing on television, I think on Magnum P.I., uh, somebody had kissed somebody with their mouth open, you know. And so that's, so she comes in to kiss me. And I just remember just being like, like opening my mouth up real wide, you know. And everybody laughed at me and she still tried to kiss me kind of but it was just fucking embarrassing but anyway man what happened to you <laughs> wasn't that cool it was a girl <laughs> it was, a <laughs> it it was a little I, dude I, I seen the pain i felt bad for a second i i was a girl across the street her name was krista hayes krista renee hayes Ooh, I remember renee name. dude i'll tell you this every poor kid their middle name the girl is renee fucking renee How, it is it not <laughs> no for sure i got two nieces yeah, from for, the same mother sure. and both of them's middle name <laughs> are renee and, Renee. No, those families have middle names. Like ours is Ann. I dated two girls that had the middle name Ann, and my daughter then had the middle name Ann. Yeah. So it's fucking, it's that. My grandmother's name was Margaret Elizabeth Ann or Margaret Ann. But Renee is that poor, Renee yeah. is poor white oh, middle dude, name. Oh, dude, for sure. Yeah, it's just got to, it's got to, it feels razzly dazzly. Yeah. Renee. Renee. Yeah. yeah. Krista Renee Hayes. Especially her name was Hayes, so I thought the Nay and Hayes was cool. Renee Krista Hayes. Renee Hayes. Yeah. Yeah, she was my first kiss, man. She was a little blonde girl across the street and god she, she sounds she beautiful was cute. she was cute as a button dude she was a little bitty thing and she was awesome that was my first kiss my first blow job was outside of a girl's group home oh yeah i could see that <laughs> yeah right i could the easily dude's group see home that. and the girl's group home was by each other yeah and, and what happened you snuck over there or what yeah was well, we it? used to meet outside and hang out because we were allowed to hang out outside mm -hmm. and then one day we went over by the the house where the air conditioning, air conditioning unit bro. yeah god. right there by the air conditioning many, unit. why don't air conditioning <laughs> units advertised you can get blown uh, behind they're here the best dude dude it, uh, and it's the noise kind of you know keeps oh, you yeah, feel, keeps makes you feel like more cover yeah and if you fuck on top of it it kind of shakes and it gives off a little like hot air oh like that's what we needed you know how the thing is up top it gets a little like it's like a uh like a stove thing kind of on top of it that blows a little hot air oh the yeah. Fan thing. yeah it is kind of sexy but really. i went over there japanese and I, got, almost, I got my kinda. first blow job and i knew right then that that was fucking the greatest thing ever. Oh, you was into blowjobs at that point? Oh, dude, listen. I mean, I knew that I, I was excited to get the pussy, and it was a little let down compared to what the blowy was. Oh, you yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. fucking ever since then, it's kind of, you know, the other thing's almost a chore. It's like, oh, we got to do that. But Yeah, there's something <laughs> interesting about somebody being willing to admit they're willing to put their face on your penis. Yeah, for absolute choice. Until, just... the, until the point of it, it spitting. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That whole shit is just until you get, fucking yeah. wild. When you hit pure, yeah, there's, you know, I remember this gal tried to give me a BJ, and uh, I mean, once, well, a couple times. One time I was at a party, we were going to sneak off into the woods. And the woods, we didn't know it was swampland, right? So we're oh. back there. 30 40 yards into these woods and it's like that remember that movie artex and the swamp of sadness it's oh. just damn we're up to our necks and damn i mean leeches uh, i mean who knows i mean right. there's no potential i mean mother nature's blowing me at this <laughs> yeah, point sure. something's blowing oh, me yeah. you know what i'm saying there's it's thick we're and where you're sludge. from it could have legit been a goddamn alligator <laughs> oh, it could have been anything bro sure. it could have been a toothless alligator boy <laughs> you know what i'm saying hum and nub down oh, there but i'll alligator. tell you this man uh so we couldn't do it because of weather, you know, logistics. Right. So then two or three weeks later, there's a... <laughs> There's another party. So y'all had a rain delay. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah rescheduled yeah. the game. For sure. <laughs> oh, think about it. You're fitting to get your first blowjob. Ref calling it off. The game gets called off. And, uh, fucking tornado and that had been, I mean, it was the bare grills of, you know, we were out in the, you know, it was damn, it was, I was getting hungry. That's how long <laughs> I was out there. So then the next time was another party. And... Me and her snuck outside, and she starts to give me some type of a blowjob or something, and the girl whose house it is, the mom, comes out from behind a tree, dude. No. And we're right there. And 
and she's like, what's going on? And um, I didn't know what to say. And you're you like, know? you know what's going on, lady. <laughs> and I, I felt like she kind of should have known, you yeah, know. For sure. But I remember just saying that uh, this girl was washing my penis. I remember saying <laughs> And the mom looked at me like I was such an asshole for <laughs> saying that. And I said it off the tip of my tongue. I thought it wasn't that bad of a thing to say. And uh, and she made us go back to the party. She just like, you guys go back to the party. And Oh, she didn't even get to enjoy it. She got rained out the first time and got fucking the flag on the play the second time. And then... <laughs> Some guy at school beat me up and stole her from me. No, you got because your... he heard she was giving blowjobs. No. Oh, fuck. Yeah. So damn, man. God, that the worst sucks. feeling in the world is getting your ass kicked about a piece of pussy you didn't get. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> fuck, man. Oh, but I'm that sorry. Was, man, that time was fun, man. God, yeah. it was fun. No, I still remember my first Hummer. It was fucking absolutely awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. fucking. It was a thing. I still yeah. remember her name too. It was Anita. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah really? Sure. Oh yeah. Anita is an interesting name. Huh? Yeah, it was another one of those the names. Spanish lady? <laughs> no, nah, no, nah, she was all American purebred, white trash like myself. Hey, Amen. Yeah, yeah, Anita. I could see that being. Yeah. That's very much. I could see that being like also a white kind of white trash name. Blue Chew, you know it. Blue Chew, baby. Them penile hitters, daddy. It's a unique online service. Delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis. If you want that extra confidence when it's time for sex, when you get in or doing sex or considering it, Blue Chew can help. Blue Chew's licensed medical providers, they work with you to find the right ingredient and strength for your prescription. You don't like swallowing pills? No problem. The tablets are chewable. Chew your way to that hearty wang. That's right. And guys, here's a special deal for you. If you want to get well in that heater, baby, try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code, T-H-E-O, to meet up. That's right. Use promo code Theo at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. Promo code Theo to receive your first month for free. So then how did the music really start to pop up? When did that start to really bloom in your life, you know? When I was incarcerated the last time, <laughs> they, all stories go back to this, <laughs> sadly. Um, now, were you behind bars, actually, or you just like in a little room with a door? Well, it depends. I've always every, wondered that. Every jail's different. They have some that are actually like barred. You prefer the bars or the door? Oh, uh, door. A little more privacy. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a little, little peep window there, you know what I mean? A little pie flap, though hand you food through if you're locked down or something but and did y'all have any sports groups in there were you is it like yeah a, i boxed whenever i was young and uh it's my love for fighting um and still like as a fight fan a boxing fan we had a program at one of the facilities and uh they had basketball courts at most of them but you know what i'm really good at because of juvenile mm. i'm fucking forrest gump with a ping pong paddle theo really i'm dude i could be in the i could be an olympian it's crazy. I fucking fuck forced up. Wow. I am so I haven't played in years. Anytime we get drunk and find a ping pong table, I just goddamn go you in there. Feel and it, huh? Pow, 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 pow. I look like fucking the fat Serena Williams, just yeah. fucking moving, baby. <laughs> just I can fucking play ping pong, dude. Because I wasn't good enough to get on the basketball court with all yeah. the black guys, so you know I just held court at the ping pong table in juvenile, and I that, like that. Just, that was my thing. But uh, yeah, it was. But I was the last time I was in jail, jail. Yeah, and I knew that Bailey was born while I was incarcerated. That's my daughter. That's my oldest. That's my and did that bang you up? Yeah, I mean it fucked with me. You know what I'm saying? It was like it was the most first moment where I realized I couldn't be selfish. So I was like selfish as far as like I had a reason to live outside of self because mm. I tell people all the time without purpose. Jason D. Ford will drive him. He's a train that's destined to wreck. Yeah. Right? It's purpose that drives me every day. It's providing for my daughter. It's making music that helps people. It's helping friends. It's building stuff bigger than myself because I put so little value into myself, mm. obviously. Right? So at that moment, I was like, I got to do something. I can't. I don't want to be an absent father. I had a very present father. I didn't want to be an absent father. And I was like, I need to, you know, I need to stand up and do something here. And 
I have my skill sets are still to this day utterly fucking limited. Minimal? I mean, yeah, dude, I'm not good at much. I mean, really? ping pong and songs and you know, <laughs> talking shit a little bit, and that's fucking. Yeah. And there it stops. You know what I'm saying? It's like. Yeah, you know, that is a short list. Yeah, I'm not going to win a talent you. show or anything like that <laughs> if I had to do something other than what I do now, you know? Right. And I was like, man, I don't, I, you know, music's got to be it. So I came home and started putting out mixtapes. I tell you where I got fucking. Can I ask him to pull up some? Can I have a pull up some moment? Yeah. Pull up Jelly Roll 10 Minute Freestyle. My buddy Chad Arms recorded this, and he had a, like a Sony flip cam or something when I first got out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yep, right there. And this is the second or third time we put it up, right? Um, so this particular video was early early to it this was uh, we put this up in 16 but i actually had it up before from in like 2000 and that's you or nine yeah that's me fresh out i mean when i say fresh out of jail like yeah. i had just got that haircut oh, my homeboy I, had just bought me that shirt i can tell that this is very near a halfway house because that guy in the hustler shirt is always with He's always in the background of every halfway house video. Yes, no, for sure, dude. That this guy is, Frank or whatever his name yeah, is. I mean, I know no, he's not. He probably is Frank. Sure. It's my Uncle T-Shaw. <laughs> is yeah. it really? He's like a Frank. I get the thing. But, dude, that dude this is, is in a the half, background. This is like that kind of a thing, for gang, sure. Gang, We're gang. Like, you know, I'm fresh out. The lady I was with at the time bought me a phone. I <laughs> This is how old this was. I referenced the phone because in the Freedom of the Freestyle, I say, uh, your baby mama loved me, been out of jail for a week and got a touchscreen. Mm -hmm. It was like a big deal to have a touchscreen phone back yeah, then yeah, for yeah, me yeah. at least. This was like two. It, the first time it came out was in 2008. Let's see that shit. Run it up. Five for a half a pluck, and I ain't tripping. That's the real price. Jelly roll is real white, but still got the coke, and it's real nice. It's got a base tip, but sometimes it's real white, and you don't know what a hundred stacks feels like. It's cash deal. I said it's cash deal. I ain't got a gram to sell you. I crush up a Nashville. I'm really on my money, man. I'm on the paper check. Yeah. So this is it, right? You should, if you ever got ten minutes to blow, it's worth watching. Dang, I, I was baby. just like fresh out of jail with a lot to say, and we upload it in 2008 when i 2000 no my fault 2009 when i first got home and where does all that come from so how do you get to this place though i see that you know like your mother had issues she probably maybe had some type of alcoholism or something you know yeah. you said that she had some issues right? right right but how do you get to be this guy you know hip-hop I yeah. was just rapping everywhere I went, dude. I was in the county jail holding court, dude. I had guards that would take me to different units to freestyle battle yeah. people. Before Eminem did the Eight Mile movie, I was living the Eight Mile movie. Wow. Right? In jail. And in jail. Dude, I had a guy named Jazz Howard. Shout out to Jazz Howard from Cross Tracks. He would take me to different barber shops and different projects in Nashville and bet $10,000 cash. I could out rap any rapper in that project. Damn. So, you know, the local barber shop would like send somebody to the neighborhood real quick, like shoot over there and grab such and such and then yeah. such and such. Grab and Ducky. So I'd fuck him up. I'd light his ass on fire. Yeah. Grab Jazz, Mouse Mouse. Dude, Jazz, give me a couple grand. I was like, fucking yeah. Like, I was like in jail. The the, the Back to the, the jail story. When I come home, Dad bails me out. I call Dad. I say, Dad, I need you to come bail me Dang. out. I said, I'm going to pay you back. They got a freestyle battle Sunday at this club. I need to borrow $100 so I can enter it. <laughs> I need you to bail me out. Give me 100 bucks, and I'm going to go enter this, and I'm going to win $1,000. Yeah. He didn't blink. He was like, yeah, whatever. Go do it. And I had to, they had to sneak me in because I wasn't old enough to get in. It was Sunday night, Outer Limits. Eric McAnally, Joseph Herbert are running the promotional company there. They sneak me in. I go in. Win a thousand dollars right then. You must have came been home, shook. showed my pops. He was like, "Hell yeah, son!" And I was like, "Listen, I'm gonna go back and win it again next week." They did it for ten weeks. For nine weeks, I went in there and won thousand uh -huh. dollars every time. True fucking story. And do you? I lost one week out of ten. And what cost you that one week? You know you who think? beat me? Who was this? It? Is gonna fuck y'all up. You ever seen my boy Ka Hill on Broadway with the drums? He sits on Broadway and raps. Oh, in uh, downtown right Nashville? Right downtown on Nashville uh -uh. on Broadway. You got to go see him. He's there every weekend. He sets a drum kit up in front of merchants, and he beats and he freestyles while people are walking by, right? And he makes a living doing this. Wow. He's the dude that beat me. Uh. He's the one dude that beat me, and I'm still friends with him to this day. He's on uh, Instagram as Broadway Rapper, but he's my boy, and to this day, he's the only one to beat me. Yeah, but I went and did that. I've just always been in the rap. So I came home from jail. 
uploaded this it fucking went viral back then we had to take it down because i have a line in there that says in my po ask i hang drywall yeah and my po made me take it down she was like we're gonna violate your probation you're making a mockery of the state of tennessee she like scolded me and i had to take it down so we put it up many years later but it went what they called viral back then early early youtube dude when you had to go you when you could only get to youtube from a hard computer yeah you know you didn't have a laptop you had to go to desktop type in www.youtube.com you gotta write it all the way out yeah all the way dude. you gotta hit the w's on there you know it's a thing so what uh so now so now you're at the spot though where you have the number five song yes sir and on the rock rock radio yes, on sir. rock radio yes sir so how do you get from where you were then to now like what kind of happened take me through some more of it i fell in love with songwriting through the process of writing raps I immediately, I was boxed into being a freestyle rapper. Okay. And I was like, I don't want to be known for that. So I started writing like songs. And all of my choruses were really soulful and I'd rap the verses. I had a song called, you pull up Ride, Jelly Roll, Riding All Alone. And I had this record called Riding All Alone. And it was really slow. And me and Little White, first of all, Little White from 3 Six Mafia, you probably remember Oxy Cotton, yeah. Jones Bar, Perker Sess and Lure Tabs, still one of my best friends to this day. And when I first came when home from, from Memphis, jail, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's Memphis as fuck, too. When I first came home from jail, we did a song together, and Juicy J and DJ Paul ended up 3 Six Mafia producing an album with me, White, and a guy named Pete Peasy. But <clears throat> outside of the first song I put out with him, I started putting out these super like soulful joints like this. Uh, maybe go to like the minute mark or something. I just want you to hear the chorus so you can kind of get a feel for where I'm coming from here. And see, this was released in 2010. Right, so this is, you know, fucking 12 years ago, right? I just keep on smoking like fuck it. I'm prepared to die. Say a prayer, cause Lord, if you're there, gotta right here. send me a Watch this. So Check this out, Theo. You can stop right there, Hanson. But it's Dang, like, baby. yeah, but it's like this, you know, 12, 13 years ago, right? Because if it went yeah, to YouTube, that would be then, good. Now, that 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 would be good. Now, I mean, that's good now. Yeah. So, if so then I didn't realize I was singing that chorus, right? You know what I mean? Like I didn't register to me that I was singing because uh, I wouldn't like open up and sing it. You know what I mean? So right. I just kind of like did this like talk sing thing because i wasn't confident in my voice so i've kind of always knew and this is something else i'm glad i got to show this to a platform as big as yours because the therapeutic music that i make now that's yeah. so personal has always been my approach to music like when you listen to that i'm talking about doctor said if i don't quit uh quit living like this I'm, uh, i won't live to see 35 i just keep on smoking like fucking i'm prepared to die mm. i've always wrote from that kind of dark perspective you know yeah, because I'll listen to Save Me sometimes when I need to feel how – sometimes I'm too busy, I notice, or too caught up to really just get my own feelings out. Right. And so I'll listen to Save Me just to – so somebody else can do it for me almost right. in a weird yeah. way. You know, a lot of times I can get them, but sometimes you can't. No, it's that's like, the beautiful thing of music, man. Yeah. Yeah, music is uh, music is the soundtrack of the soul. And that's how I've always looked at it. Just like tears are the the expression of words we can't articulate. And I look at music as being the soundtrack to the soul. So I've always wanted to make music that would help people. That song is a great example. That song's fucking 13, 14 years old. So I always, so the transition has been very slow. It seems like it happened quick for the unseen eye because guys now are like, dude, it's crazy. You're on rock radio, which is fucking crazy to me too. But the idea that like you know we've always leaned that way i just didn't know i could sing mm. five six years ago i started like really singing i got drunk and went and sang but you gotta you gotta do you gotta go to karaoke song yeah i do um actually i do rocking around the christmas tree right i do a christmas carol because i'm not that great of a singer and um everybody likes it everybody at first is like fuck this guy you know yeah. queer you yeah. know <laughs> but then like 10 seconds into it they're like you will get a cent you know or they're like rocking her you know yeah, for sure they, so it's like nobody can really super hate on a christmas carol so i'll play it a safe bet right no dude it's awesome but what i love about that is i tell people we all secretly have a go-to 
song we sing in those moments, you know, karaoke yeah. thing. Oh, I wish mine was that Smashing Pumpkins song, bro. Saw you with this man, you got me <laughs> like you vomited. You know what mine God, is? that one's good. Mine is and has always been Old Time Rock and Roll by Bob Seger. Just take those old records off. The sh- that's ain't, that ain't yeah. it, is it? Oh, that's it. That's it, it for is? sure, yeah. How 100%. Do I know that? It's crazy, right? Yeah. It's like the song that's stuck in every white trash human's mind forever. Yeah. But it's, uh, <laughs> and you forget it's there, and then it pokes its little fucking head out, and you're like, yeah, fucking, I do know that song. Take that <laughs> Look, it'll help you finish cleaning the kitchen. <laughs> I know sure, that yeah. shit, bro. That won't my slide around put, my socks. Yeah. <laughs> my mom used to put on Brian Adams. She got one of those cassette tape deals where you give them 30 cents and they send you six cassettes or whatever and then you don't pay them and they sue you, right? <laughs> so we had that deal and one of them was Brian Adams. Yes. Uh, look into my heart. Yeah, oh, yeah. And you will see what you mean to me there we go sing it to us steve that should be your new i can't one. but mine was old, okay, mine, mine was old time rock and roll and i go out with some business guys one night that i'm working on a production deal with and uh, it sounds like drugs yeah like, go fucking, on, go on. yeah it's fucking torturous <laughs> and and we're all doing karaoke drunk and i did bob seger and somebody in the group was like dude you can really fucking sing and i don't know why it's it's all it took for me to be like Maybe I can. And I just started singing. Wow. I started like really singing, like yeah. from my ball sack then. You know, at, at first I was just singing from my chest. Then I started singing from my ass. Yeah. That's when I was like, just clench my butt cheeks together and fucking open my little fucking Vulva. hips and just fucking, brrr, you know, yeah. just go for it. So, like a hound dog. The problem is I'm now having to learn how to sing and work backwards from there. So it's like trying to do the stable stuff, you know what I mean? Or yeah. the inflections of lower stuff is like, it's so fucking hard. Where it's like, just take those old records off the shelf. Yeah. It's so much fucking easier, right? Than like, I use man's a, you know, yeah. it's hard. Yeah, that sounds hard. I uh I want to say this though, dude. What about the ladies? So you got married. Where'd you meet your wife at? I know your wife has a wild story. Oh, dude, my wife is fucking the fucking best. I met her in Vegas at a show. And she's, be- look, I'll say this, beautiful lady. I've seen her a couple times. She come in the room. She ain't looking at me. She's looking at you. Oh, dude. You know, you can man. tell that wife is dialed into you. No, nah, that's my girl, man. She, she, she's the sweetest woman on earth. And uh, I met her in Vegas, and I was really down on my luck. I was living out of a van. I was fucking damn. Uh, you know, literally, I was living out of a conversion van. I was just vanned like, out. Huh? Yeah, where was, doing, was you urinating at? Oh, dude, just on the side of the freeway. Same place I was shitting. You know, truck stops, and you know, we were doing two hundred and fifty years. Oh, dude, flying J's and love. Oh. Stay away from TAs. TAs are the fucking word. They're the trailer park of truck stops. I've been saying that, dude. A friend of mine reached in. They had a, a lot fishing well or something in there at one of them yeah, and he only got imagine. meningitis from the damn yeah, tank in there <laughs> <laughs> but I will say this though he fucking I do remember he dropped a Laffy Taffy in that bitch and he reached in and fucking yeah, got fuck it that fucking so part of that's on him baby you know what I'm saying yeah, dog dude, if you eating candy out of an aquarium at a truck stop oh, dog then that look the lord he gets to do what he wants nothing you know? is trashier than a TA yeah if I wake up on the bus and we're at a TA I'm just like fuck me man how oh, did this yeah. happen I can't even open my bowels up at a damn TA bro but you get me over to a flying J you get me to a loves oh my what God. I love about loves dude if you're using the urinal or the shitter in there you can shit and hear somebody play buck hunter right outside the door oh for sure dude pilots are fucking awesome as well yeah they're pretty good the apple barns or whatever they're called that we I get to been the west there. coast they're kind of trash but yeah so we were like doing 200 and something shows a year and it's like wow! So you guys were on the road, man. Dude, I was opening with who? up for fi- everybody. I mean, I went out with the Insane Clown Posse. But the first people that ever took me in a little whiteout was a group called Twisted. They were signed to ICP at the time. Great dudes, man. Shout out, Skinny Paul and Puppy. Jamie. You ever go out with them? No, but I did go out with Mushroom Head, the metal band. Mm-mm. They're fucking fire. I went out Pull with up everybody. a picture of them, Mushroom Head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is awesome. Skinny and them. On this ICP tour one time, I was the first act of five, so I didn't have a like dressing room or nothing. Oh, and that means I went on when people were like, you know, still walking in the door and buying popcorn and stuff. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it was the worst set of worst wow. set ever. And this band invited me, gave me the code to their bus, and they would let me use their bus as my green room. 
and I'm forever grateful to Skinny and this band. To this day, we're friends because wow. they were so good to me. And dude, I had a 1994 conversion band, like a Southern Comfort high top. <laughs> And uh, this 1990 something, 95, 96, I got, we called it Bertha. And everybody who toured with me back then has Bertha tattooed on them. Shout out Scary Larry and the crew. They all, Casey Strums, they all, yeah, that's it. That's my van. I feel like that that white one down there with the high top. Oh, no, on the left, left. Left, 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 right right there, there. right. Yep, the white one. Boom. That is fucking Bertha, son. Wow. That is big Bertha to a fucking T. Did it have curtains in the windows on the inside? That might be a picture. Yes, sir, it did. That might be a picture of my van. We hung a TV up in it. Scary Larry and Casey hung up a TV. Me and Highlight would sit back there and fucking watch fucking old DVDs and stuff. And the (laughs) the, the third. Today, that'd be damn homoerotic. It was, was dude. dude. Yo, the back. We we carried a trailer on it, so the back seat would lay down to a bed, Mm -hmm. kind of like a futon or something. And I lived in that motherfucker, Theo like shit when I met my wife I was like I, I was like come let's smoke a blunt in the van and she got in the van and she said it gave, to this day she tells the story it gave her anxiety because it was so trashy it like smelt like fucking cum and cigarettes it was yeah. like you know it was fucking six grown and people been there. doing cum, cum in there oh doing cum in there cocaine wow. in there fucking I think some guys were tying their arms off it was bad we were struggling out there man it was Damn a rough boy. run dude for us and the devil's tug of war yeah, right we there, lived in there we called it Bertha dude everybody's got Bertha tattooed on if you toured with me in that era you got Bertha tattooed on God. you God. Dude, that's not. when touring was so different. There was before before uh, smartphones. It was just you were just at the will of the world. Oh, dude, fifty dollars a night is what I got paid for like three years straight. Like fifty bucks a night. We didn't have enough room to get gas and a hotel. Yeah. So it was like we just had to go fucking park at truck stops and sleep some nights. You know, we were banging on merch. We were counting on hand to hand CDs and T shirts. And dude, how do you used to do them? I'll tell you this. I used to bring. So I remember one at one point I bought that burner, baby. Really? I bought that three shelf burner, bro, from my from the uh, CDs. I think I was in Nam up near Canada, and somebody run that bitch across the border. Still had sweat on the outside of it. Really? You talking yeah. about the CD burn of the tower, right? I bought you burned the tower, three CDs at one and time. And I burned three, and it took yes. about nineteen. And minutes. then we'd put them on a spindle. I'd hand write on every Me fucking too. one of them, dude. I'd write, and Theo I would Vaughan. sell them right off the spindle. And I'd make a title of a different title, like, Me too. like they were different albums. No, or for sure, we did that for fun, one. or we'd autograph them, or have the friend homie autograph some. It was just like, and we'd sell them <laughs> off the spindle. Like we wouldn't even yeah. give you a case for them. We'd just be like, oh, pff, right off the spindle, this is yours for three dollars, you know, or five dollars, or whatever. I could. I used to do it for donations, oh, in hopes that somebody give it. me some more money. I'd be like, look, man, I'm just fucking. I got forty bucks to open this show. Like, so yeah, I remember a lady one out. time in in Fort Worth, Texas, came up and gave me a hundred dollars. She's like, my husband just died. Really? And she gave me a hundred dollars for for, for the for one of the CDs off the spindle. Just gave it. She didn't want the album. I don't blame her. Wow. She was like, I don't really care. I'm not into your art. I'm yeah. just into your hustle. I think yeah. about how many people bought the CD and never listened to it. Oh, I think like every the guys single in one. Manhattan. I want to say thank you to everybody that everybody that bought. <laughs> Sometimes I think it was a DVD, dude. I don't even know what was on that bitch, yeah. but I sold them. And thank you, man. Yeah, no, for yeah, we did it. And I was at that phase of my life when I met Bunny, and she was like. She like she like adopted a little pound puppy. And where'd you meet her at? Where were you guys at? We were at this bar called the Las Vegas Country Saloon on Fremont Street. That's a lot of titles in one. Yeah, it's pretty big. The Las Vegas Country Saloon and Fremont Street. And Bunny was doing high end escort stuff. She was a sex worker in Ooh. Vegas, and she was getting a lot of money. I mean, she had like a real big plush penthouse, and we had a sex worker on the podcast and, one time. Oh, dope! You should get Bunny yeah. on here one time. She'd love to tell her story. She has a podcast. We need to get you on her podcast too. It's called Dumb Blonde Podcast. Lead us in here, Theo. I need to plug my wife. Dumb, Dumb Blonde, Blonde podcast. podcast. We'll put a link to into yeah, it. For yeah, yeah. She's she's crushing, man, and uh, she's like on on Apple. She's always in like the top ten on the comedy charts. She really kills. But uh, Bunny just just took me under, you know, kind of took me under her wing, and and you know, the what cool, was it about her? I think she was just, it was like a genuine thing. The moment I met her, like I just knew she was a, you could feel the genuineness from her, and she was in a very ungenuine business, right? Like that business is slimy. Oh yeah, it's a lot of shucking. It's a lot of game being ran on both ends. She's running game. They're running game. It's just a lot of game happening. It's it was just, I could just feel the authenticity in our, in, in her though. I just like, 
I hate to be the cliche like I felt it. It was soulmates at sign, but I felt yeah. that for real, Bubba. Like I felt that connection with her, and she did too. And and how'd you convince her to do it? Because if she's living this lavish life, you know, she's living a more lavish life as a lot of those, you know, a lot of sex workers. If they get dialed in on their business, and they're yeah. business women as well, or business men, if they mm-hmm. gay yeah, workers, for sure. then they get, you know, they do real well. You know, so how do you get her? To, I mean, if she stops in that van, I think, damn, this bitch smells like repossession. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be out of there, yeah. bro. Nah, dude, she was damn, uh, bro. Nah, they got she, ghosts of freaking yeah. people jerking off in this yeah. bitch. Yeah, nah, damn. Shit. If four people live in a van and I roll up and have any business sense, the last thing I'm doing in that van is falling I'm in love. You, dude, she, the absolute she, last thing. I I freaking leave one of my legs in that bitch. No, nah, she fall in picked love. up a fucking stray pit bull. She said it was. She said her attraction was I was clearly the saddest human she'd ever met. <laughs> I swear to God, that's hey, what she I'm said. I'm glad another's hope she for us because I'm the second one. And she was like, "You had the saddest eyes in the room." Damn. I don't know. We just connected, man. It was like it felt like a love story that was supposed to work. I mean, we're talking about a woman. You know, we're talking about an ex drug dealer and an ex prostitute get together and build what we've built together. You know, a oh, woman yeah. who has a podcast is crushing a big Patreon. She does, she still does the OnlyFans thing and absolutely just fucks that and crushes that to death. And then, you know, I went on to fuck, dude. I'm sitting here talking to fucking Theo Vaughn on a podcast that I spoke into existence two calendar years ago. Yeah. Right? I didn't know you from the man on the moon. You just moved to Nashville, what, almost two years ago or whatever? And I was I like... It has been almost a year and a yeah, half. I can't even yeah, believe it. It's been that. at least a year and a half and I banged yeah. you immediately. I didn't know you from the man on the moon. I was like, yo, I'm from here. Like, I need to get on the cast. You know, and here I sit. It's like, and not just because you're hearing my story because I consider us homies. Yeah. Like, you're my boy. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're just talking about some shit we talk about in the fucking... In the, fucking green room of zanies right now right? yeah and it was funny too it's like you can sometimes people are always like i want to be on the this and that and sometimes it just works out how it works out it's like sometimes you almost just have to have a time for me anyway where you where you feel like oh I, this person's in my life i want to talk you know i saw you the other night at, at brennan's show and i was like man i just seen you a few times where we you know we'd seen each other in different places and i'm like man every time that guy is just People want to be around that dude. guy. You know, Bless. that guy just lights up the fucking room. I just love man. people, dude, man. Yeah. And they love person. you. Oh, dude, I love them and I love you. They love you, But it's you, like, man. who would have thought that me and Bunny's story would end up, you know, where it's at? And I think she did before I did. Yeah. And I think that's why she took the fucking, you know, the fucking pound puppy in. She was like, I think she had even the vision I didn't at the time, you know? Oh, yeah. And I'm I was, sure you I was, was drooling, dude. Yeah, I was It was like homeo and drooliet, oh, baby. Dude, you know what I'm sure. saying, right? Y'all I tell like, people, I didn't pick Bunny. Bunny picked me. Yeah, you know what I'm a, saying? That's she's the man sure. in the situation. Yeah, for sure. I was just like, yes, I'll go out with you. Yeah. <laughs> and that's just kind of how it worked. And That's awesome. Yeah, we've been together, you know, I think six years, going on seven years now. Been together wow. A long time. And do you think y'all will have a child or not? I don't think so. I don't think that's something that's in our, you know, Bunny didn't have a desire to birth a child. But she always had a desire to be around children. So I think that we kind of fed each other's needs. I got custody of my daughter <laughs> right when I met Bunny. Dude, you know when somebody poor, when they grew up poor and white, when somebody says, I have custody. Yeah, the for second sure. the word custody hits the air, yeah, bro. For sure. That's the most word. That was the word that I always yeah. heard growing no, up. No, it was like you I know? had custody. You know, I don't like telling this part. Of, well, I want to tell it. I think she appreciates it now. Her mother had a battle with a heroin addiction, uh, Bailey's mother, my daughter. And she's sober now and back in Bailey's life, which is awesome. Oh, that's amazing. But at the time, it was bad. I mean, like, you know, really, really, really true addict stuff bad. So I was getting custody of Bailey at simultaneously courting Bunny, all while some other girls, like, in week three of being pregnant. Wow. So it was like a really weird moment where Bunny had every reason to run. Yeah. And instead, she just fucking, that bitch dug her heels in and was like, let's fucking go. Throw me the fastest pitch you can, big boy. Damn. I'm going to catch it. And we immediately... You know, took got custody of Bailey. She started raising Bailey as her own. To this day, Bailey calls Bunny Mama and calls her mother Mom. Mm. So you know, and her mother was in a same sex relationship. She's gay. So the other yeah. girl that raised Bailey from birth is a part of it too. So Bailey's got three moms. Damn. You know what I mean? Yeah, dude. Just fucking. That's a limit. To, yeah, it's a thing, dude. I mean, it's a big. That's a legal pool. limit, I think, yeah, in a yeah. lot of a lot I'm of states. I'm the only testosterone in the room besides Bunny because she's a little aggressive sometimes. But it's all fucking bitches and me. But uh, it works out great. 
Do you have, uh, were there's, tell me about one of the toughest times you guys had on the road. Was there, you guys partied pretty hard, I'm sure. Was there yeah. a night where you didn't think you was going to make it? Any nights you end up at the hospital? Yeah, I, I had a. Because I had a night, man, this is a few years back. This is more than a few years back now, but I was like sitting there and I was so close to going to the freaking emergency room. My heart just, mm. just rattling, baby. Just, you know, like, so like a cheerleader was shaking right. that bitch. Mine was codeine, so it was the opposite. Damn. It was going so slow that between breaths, I would hold my breath for a second and put my my thumb up to my throat or behind my ear to see if I could just catch a light poop. Poop. And I was like, I thought I just drank too much cough syrup, and I thought it was over. I'll and how much did you drink it? What dude. was it, Dime Tap? Yeah, no, 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 dude. We were doing, you know, we were getting, we were getting the real active actors, and you know, we were going for, the, we were mixing the potions, and oh wow. Sometimes we just get the the straight pink, the codeine, or you know, just the straight, you know, what. Sometimes we get the purple, but we, you know, we do. We were doing, you know, eight, ten, twelve ounces, just filling up, put dropping fours and sprites every day, and just getting them gone before noon. And then I'd be so low, I'd from that fucking four ounces or six ounces or eight ounces of codeine, I would fucking do some blow to pick myself up. And then I'd take a Xanax to try to go back to sleep, you know? And that's what I tell people too when they're like, you need to worry about your health. I'm like, trust me, man, I'm gonna live a long, longer life than y'all think. I have changed my ways dramatically. <laughs> when people see me out drinking a lot, they're like, you're fat and drink a lot. I was like, I used to do eight balls of cocaine after eating codeine for breakfast and I would balance it out with Xanax. Fuck you, I was a Molotov cocktail of death. If that didn't kill me, I think a little obesity will be okay while I'm currently working to lose the weight, Karen. I'll be fucking all right, okay? I don't need you worried about my heart. I have a cardiologist bitch i'm fine i'm losing weight you should have seen me when i was just running around like my drug of choice used to be more yeah. you know what i'm saying that was my drug of choice it was like what's your drug of choice what you got you know what i'm saying Fucking, oh yeah baby. what do you have the most of dude my favorite weed was uh cocaine yeah <laughs> that was it dude yeah for sure they were like damn yeah. baby only person that can smell that is you yeah, yeah. <laughs> um Guess what my dad would start doing? What's that? And this is, a, God rest his soul. He would get a couple drinks and then he would walk to the back of this bar and he would just be like, hey, can I just, I just need a cup. And they'd give him a cup and they had an ice machine in the back and he'd go fill up his own cup and then get in the car and pull out his bottle from under the seat. <laughs> He mixed his own drink right there in the console, put his seatbelt on, dropped the top on his little seat brain convertible, put his sunglasses on. He'd, he'd, he'd have one for the road, man. Damn. He was <laughs> yeah. in a damn seat ring? Yeah, dude. He had a seat ring, man. It's the only, when he passed away, you know, there wasn't a lot to, to divvy up around the family and because uh, his wife's a cunt. But oh, what yeah. what 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 we did end up getting? I have met her, but I know her. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> so, but what we did get was his Sebring, and I gave that. We well, I, I, well, like I was in charge of giving shit away, but as a family, we decided to give that to Scott, so his son could have it, who's in college, or you know what I mean, or whatever. And his, the, the Sebring's still around, dude. Scott Scott's one of my response. My two brothers are super responsible. I'm not. Scott and Roger. Roger's the oldest. Scott's the next one. So Scott has the Sebring and. Roger just wanted the Kentucky Derby stuff because they, him and Dad used to go bet on horses together, you know, and Horse. all the stuff related to the meat business. And I took the pictures of the clowns. But yeah, dude, the Sebring is still in the fucking family. Scott tended that bitch. Scott tuned that motherfucker up. It's nice, man. It's running. That guy, that thing's pimping. Every time I go see him down in Georgia, we'll take the Sebring out to go get a drink. Hey, come in it, bro. Make <laughs> yeah, it mean something. That's it, dude. I did lose Bertha. Yeah, I'm sad about that. I missed the, I missed my van. Uh, that thing needed to go, dude. Yeah. That thing. I put four transmissions in, and I put four hundred thousand thousand miles on it we beat that thing to death yeah wow on the fifth transmission i just never went back and picked it up damn yeah yeah, yeah dude i remember my friend billy conforto dude who was uh probably the greatest gay prize fighter that never was in like any sanctioned fights you know he just he was homosexual but he beat people up and nobody had ever seen it right <laughs> yeah it was an obscure thing oh nobody yeah, ever and sure. still i mean still you see some of it but you never saw it like this yeah. dude bro and he uh he had a, he he hired some dude in the neighborhood. He gave him like eleven hundred to fix his transmission. That dude fucking never fixed. So we went over there to pick it up. Finally, we opened up the hood and everything inside of it was gone. He beat his ass, didn't he? 
Yeah, he did. <laughs> he did, dude. And the guy thought he could punk him because he was a gay dude, yeah. you know? And, and Billy fucking lit him up, bro. I know some gay he people that can fight. He shifted every gear inside of that dude, bro. I know that, dude. I know uh, Bailey's other mother, Cheyenne, uh, her baby. Gays baby. can fight. Okay, listen, Cheyenne fights like a dude. Yeah. Bailey's other mom fights like a fucking dude. The gay women and gay men should fight each meet in the middle and fight. Oh yeah, for dude, it, listen, I got my money on Cheyenne nine out of ten times. Damn. They used to have Foxy boxing at a strip club in Nashville, and yeah. Cheyenne would show up like a ringer and just beat the brakes <laughs> off people, dude. We'd show up like a chicken fight, taking bets on the side, and Cheyenne would just be in there fanning fucking people out. It wouldn't be fair because these little girls be in there bouncing with their titties, they looking all cute, and Cheyenne would just come in there just fucking blah, thunder. Blah, blah, blah. Bow, 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 bow. Just swinging from the goddamn shoulders. Oh, all yeah. hip action, dude. Looking like fucking a karate movie. Oh, yeah, or something. putting just a lady in that into, shit. Yeah, she would just Dude, we out. had, I remember they used to have a group called Fag Fist Fights, right? Yes. And it was gay, it was a gay men group. And they came to different college towns and they'd put boxing ring at a bar and the men and gay men would fight, you know, and they would you'd buy you pay five dollars, whatever you get in. And these dudes would fight. bro. I'd pay a thousand dollars for a ringside table. One of those right now. It was crazy, man. I can't believe they used to come to in Hammond, Louisiana. They'd roll through. <laughs> Probably twice a year, and we go over there and Did watch Did the midget it. wrestlers come through, too? We never. I, I always heard about that, but I never saw that kind of shit, you oh, know? Oh, dude. We, see, we, got, we got here at the fairgrounds every other month. Yeah. It was the every best, dude. Month. It, I'm Sometimes serious, there was dude. no fair, even. It's just a, <laughs> just a couple of midgets well, no, out so there So they have this thing at the fairgrounds where you rent out little this folk, place. Little people. Dude, these fucking midgets, dude, would fuck. We're going to be politically correct now. Fuck that. They're fucking yeah, midgets, sure. dude. And they call themselves midgets. called midget wrestling. Different ones do. The old school ones, I think, will we'll say it, but... But then a lot of new, you know, if they're fancier, they won't say it. Yeah, yeah, the fancy midgets. That makes sense. The real trashy poor midgets are like midgets, right? Yeah. These were poor midgets then. Dude, but they would do like double gainer backflips off the top rope. Yeah. It was some shit that like, they should, a couple of them guys should have went to the WWE. Yeah. I don't know yeah, why. Yeah, well, they, I, I don't think. Well, WWE missed that whole. They didn't. They never got into smaller folks being in there. Yeah. Rey they Mysterio was like. The closest thing, right? Yeah. Because he was like, you know, acrobatical. I think they left the acrobatical shit to Lucha Libre wrestling. Oh, right? you go down in Mexico, you see whatever, dude. Is that you what know they what call it? Is it Lucha Libre? I believe it or could be. Or is that be. the movie? That's, the I think that's what fucking, it's called. It's called Lucha Libre, yeah. The, that wrestling was fucking, people were doing backflips and shit. And I think that's what the midget wrestling was. I think they couldn't break called. a table. I mean, they were so small, man. You'd have to cut the table down the middle before they even got on it. it yeah. Like, yeah. They would cheat it off the bottom. They would kind of bring it, you know, cut sawing three, four, three yeah, quarter inch. Sure. Do you know, uh, was there any time y'all got hijacked or anything on the road or robbed? No, nah, we never had to deal with nothing like that. Y'all we got, we not got a lot paid? of fights. Yeah, we, we got not paid a few times. We had, we stole some TVs out of venues and stuff. We've took pictures yeah. and art and all kind of stuff. Art. Yeah, we, we, yeah. It's Bar. just that thing above the urinal that says when there's a car when there's a car auction. Yeah, yeah. Manny's car art. auction this Thursday. I stole neon signs. You know what I mean? I've done all that stuff. Oh, I broke a window at a bar before. Just like then they were like, we got insurance. I was like, but you won't be open tomorrow bitch i was like fucking <laughs> dude one of my friends can you do youtube comedian touches uh neon sign <laughs> i think it's our friend jamie lisso did this uh oh shit why do they have all this stuff now Remember when you could find, there was a nine videos you could find it every time yeah now it's yeah, it jamie has lisso l-i-s-s-o-w I think it's him. Oh, there it is right there. Comedian electrocuted on stage. <laughs> I just ate three steaks and I'm still hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I just ate three steaks. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> Does he right double there, back? Boy. Oh, you gotta play one more second. It looks like he's thinking yeah, about boy. touching it again. <laughs> oh no, he really burnt him then if he didn't try it again. That's how I know I'm a special kind of hard hit. I would have had that would have had to happen twice to me. Yeah. For sure. I'd have been like, no fucking I'd have touched way. one more time. One first, sure. One more time, just like, oh, let me just see. I'd be like, that ain't real. Yeah, no, I've stolen neon sign out of a bar though. Did they ever not pay y'all? 
I'm trying to think. Yeah, Comedy but it was more like shady more stuff. Honest. Usually you had to get, yeah, the, well, usually you get with the agent before you can go get into the clubs. Before that, it's just weird rooms. They had a guy who would, it used to just be bringer shows. Like you had to bring eight people. Right. You know, and so you get there and you're like, you don't have anybody. How you can't perform. Get, how you know? did you get picked up by an agent? In your business, I think you just start doing well. You get about ten minutes going, and some manager sees you, and then the manager connects you with an agent. Usually, okay. you know, and they'll take because you got to feel like that's got to be a hard business to break. Like you just got to be crushing. Where did you cut your teeth at? I cut my teeth a little bit in New Orleans, then I cut them mostly, honestly, in L.A. Okay. You know, I moved out there, and I hadn't really performed much, and. And I took a comedy class even. I went to a class and people always make fun of the classes and shit. I went there. And the best thing about the class was I hated the class. I was like, I'm better than everybody in here, even though I wasn't. Yeah. But in my head, you know, you're just like, oh, I'm cool, you know. Right. Um, and they had, um, at the end of the class, you got to get on stage and perform. That was the graduation. Right. So you were in front of a full room and you got a three minute tape. You got your tape. And my tape was decent. So then you go around to other places and then you know next thing you know it's five years later and you're you know starting to travel around and do it and then it's 10 years later and at that time i think around 10 years i i thought about quitting i moved back home for about four or five months really yeah and live what with encouraged son. you to get back i don't know man i was with it. i broke up my girlfriend and i broke up I don't know. I was at home. I was working at a Mexican restaurant, bartending in a Mexican restaurant. I was not a good bartender. And uh, I broke some equipment and I fucking, I still might owe those people in amends, honestly. But I broke some damn equipment there. One of the margarita makers, you know, that bitch. I was trying to put it back together late at night and I couldn't figure it out. And I broke that bitch. And the guy, then they, you know, they were upset. And I don't know. At that point, I felt like, I, there was no reason for me really to stay. I think I kind of hinged my bets on this girl, kind of. Right. So when that fell apart, I felt like I didn't know what to do, and then I went back, I guess. That's what happened. Yeah. Who all did you feature for early? Oh, that's a good question, man. Uh, I featured for, the, for this one guy named Mark Lundholm. And sober guy, super funny dude, but he smoked cigars, right? And we got stuck up in uh, Notre Dame of Mishawaka, Indiana. Oh, yeah, right outside of South Bend. Right outside of South Bend, mm -hmm. man. We even went over and saw the bar where, like, Rudy would sit at and sit in yep. his seat and stuff. It was real cool. But we were stuck indoors. It was 30 degrees. We were stuck indoors, and we're sharing a, a little condo or house. And he smoked cigars. And I was like, hey, do you mind not smoking indoors? And he's like, I'm going to be smoking, you yeah. know? And that bitch would smoke two cigars before he'd go to sleep, I think. Yeah, he's just lighting yeah. them off each other. Yeah, yeah. And if I'm wrong, Mark, I'm sorry, but that's just how I remembered. And, you know, <laughs> they had a guy, Tom Rhodes, too, who I love, who I got to have on here sometime. And when he used to smoke Marlboro Reds, and he and I had to share a place in Shreveport one time. And I remember asking him, I said, hey, man, we might not smoke it indoors. He goes, I'm going to smoke it. I think he lit one right, right up. Then he might have lit two up. <laughs> he lit two up. I think it made me hold one. One more question, because I got to ask while I got you. Yeah. Well, you probably told it a thousand times, but what was your worst or most memorable bomb? Mm, I mean, I've had one that I've told where I just kept, I bombed, and they didn't know that I had to come back out between each act. It was like a battle of the bands. Oh. So they booed me off in the beginning, and I burned my material so fast because they hated me. But I had to keep coming back out. No. And it was horrible, dude. At one point, I came out with an American flag. Like, <laughs> I didn't know what like, to do. This has to bring unity. This land is yours. I didn't know what. Bro, I didn't have any material left. And I had to do like another probably 20 minutes, man. And the best part was, towards the end, I would kind of sneak like I was going to come back out. And I'm like, there's no way he's coming back out, you know? And I would just come back out. <laughs> And they would just die laughing because they couldn't believe, bro. One time I went out and sang Smooth Criminal. I didn't even fucking know the words. I, half of it was Man in the Mirror. I didn't even know the fucking words, dude. <laughs> and that shit man oh but at the time bro it hurt I felt bad even asking them to pay me oh, I just wanted God. to leave and it's such a dichotomy of leaving a place when you've crushed it and that feeling of bravado and I did good yeah. 
than that other feeling of leaving when you did not and still having to get to your vehicle, get to leave, and you know you're going to run into people. Oh, man. And you just feel that energy. <laughs> people just turning out. So, oh, Jelly Roll, so man, great. I appreciate the time, man. I feel like we covered a lot of stuff to you. You feel like we covered a lot of stuff? I love it, dude. Fuck. Yeah. If, if, when you Frankenstein, I think it'll be the funniest shit ever. What is it? I don't even know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, I don't know either, man. I'm just trying to stay alive. Jamie got a damn electrocuted, bro. That sucks. <laughs> that S U C K S, <laughs> baby. That sucks. Um, dude, thank you so much. So now you're on tour. So just tell us where you're at now. You know. Yeah, man. Here goes my shameless plug. Because um, you've had this song. You've had the, a lot of the songs that hit. What What really started to catapult you? Then let's get oh, to that. Oh, save real quick. me. Yeah. yeah, there was a lot of, like, this is what I tell people. Everything I did was a step on the ladder. Save Me was like skipping 10 steps on the ladder. Yeah. You know, well, I, knowing I, I your could, story yeah. and hearing Save Me now, it even, it, it, it's more. It yeah, means, for it, sure. It, it's under more understandable. Yeah, it's like I could bore you with, like, every little step that helped, and there were so many. S everything mattered is what I tell people. Everything you're going through right now in your career, if you're a young, up and aspiring artist, comedian, or whatever, Every one of those little things matter. And then there's like a small tipping point that happens, like the Malcolm Gladwell book, where shit just kind of, save me for me will always be that moment of like, you know, and it's, I don't know how it is in your business, but it's always the shit you don't think's going to be it. Yeah. Dude, we fucking wrote Save Me on a Sunday. We recorded Save Me on a Monday. We shot a video to, no, we were, wrote it Saturday, recorded it Sunday, shot the video Monday, put it out Tuesday. That's how that worked. Didn't think twice about it. And did you know that it would be that? You did, did you know? Did you have an inkling? Do you, honestly, did I you have any idea? I just knew that I couldn't quit fucking with it. I just knew that it was something about it that just stirred my spirit. Yeah. And I was like, I just, man, we got to go for it. And I just, I was proud of it. I was like, to me, it was like a therapy session publicly, mm. you know, and that was like the yeah. biggest thing for me was like just letting those emotions out in a public way was like, I don't know, some songs, I have songs, Theo, that I wrote that mean a lot to me that I'll never play anybody ever because they mean that much to me. And Save Me was one of those songs that could have been that song, but it meant even more to me. Mm. So it was like, nah, this one needs to go out. Like, I just, I don't know, man. I was just prepared for it to, I, I loved it so much, I didn't care what it did. If it popped or flopped, I just felt like fucking, you know, this is the last thing I'll tell you this story. People, I was talking to Travis O'Gwen from Strange Music once. We were talking about how I get thousands of emails a year of people who say, or messages a year that say, your music helped me. I overcame drug addiction. I was going to kill myself and I found your music. I was literally, I've had messages that were like, I was sitting there gun loaded, listening to a playlist that was gonna be the last listening of my life. Damn. And found a song of yours that made me feel like, man, this is, it touched me in such a way that it changed my decision. Yeah. And this is my thing. If I get 5,000 of those a year and four, thousand nine hundred and ninety nine of them are lies holy fuck can you believe we saved one fucking human you know what i mean like yeah. let's just assume everybody's full of shit but one fucking guy holy shit man you know what i mean and to yeah. me at the end of the day that's what saved me was about it was like man what means the most to me and that's why i write the music i write is people come up to me and they're, oh dude such and such was fun I love that song I danced to it but when people come up to you and say dude we played Save Me at my cousin's funeral that overdosed and it's now his mother's favorite song and the way she copes with it or we played Smoke and Section at this funeral or we played Smoke and Section to commemorate this or hey man this song helped me when I got out of rehab yeah that shit is like fucking what this shit's about dude you know what I mean like when yeah. a motherfucker's like dude I don't just watch your podcast for humor. It was the fucking first thing I laughed at after I got out of fucking sobriety. Like, that's the yeah. shit that touches the soul. You know what I mean? Yeah, a friend of mine recently told me, he said, yeah, man, if you have a story and you don't share it, if you, it's that thing that you're afraid to share. 
you know it's that scary thing you know that's the connection that's the thing that you know that somebody else could really be waiting to hear you know there's a reason why there's that magnetism of uncertainty with you with with uh, with with sharing stuff sometimes you right. know and yeah man it's it's wild the health how certain things can have an effect on people i mean there's songs i go listen to that br- of certain friends that passed away and i'll go listen to a certain song and it reminds me of them it reminds me of him it reminds me of uh uh, certain times in my life when I cared about certain things, you know, oh, it's, it is the power Here's of a song nostalgia. is really powerful. Yeah, it'll yeah. take you back to a place in time, man. Yeah, dude, it'll take me back to that freaking that Bon Jovi song, baby. You yes, know? baby, yes, baby. It'll take you right back to being in the front seat of that fucking car for however you felt the first time you heard it. Oh, heaven. it's also the greatest feeling on earth is when you hear a song for the first time and the feeling you get. Yeah, I remember certain songs in my life that I heard for the first time and like it just changed everything about how i thought about things just one song yeah don't go chasing waterfalls by tlc i remember we were driving to the mall one time and that bitch came on dude yeah. and we fucking we were never the same no, for sure i'm My telling tim you, and joey we were never the same yeah, it was we a, sang that thing do you have a favorite song uh I got some stuff that I, we play on the pod sometimes by Evan Bartels. I love. He's a local singer songwriter. I love listening to hit some of his stuff. Do I have a favorite song? You know what I like right now? Listen to Dirt by Florida Georgia Line. I just really yep. like that song. I get song. stuck on a song for a little while, you yep. know? No, um, I don't like that. I've been into country music more since I've been here. But yeah. I listen I like I've been listening to Juice World recently that I really like. Um I don't know if I have a favorite song. Do you? Yeah, well, I'm one of them weird dudes that has a top five in every category of everything. I've got I've got a top five comedy bit list oh, wow. of like what I think was the best top five comedy bits for, to me personally. But song wise, number one as of now, they they're subject to change every now and then. Is "Against the Wind" by Bob Seger. That song just has told my story, and I feel like it's the story of who I am as a human, what I've been through as an artist, and where I'm at as an artist now. And uh, I just remember the first time I heard that song and just thinking, man, this is this is my life, and, and I still feel it every time I listen to it. So you got things onto YouTube, you, and then things started to really pop from there then, when Save Me came out. Yeah, man. It was just building the YouTube and, you know, just building the, just putting out music. And oh, yeah, talking with about 30 something million. I mean, your spins are crazy, man. Yeah, yeah. Save Me is at almost 100 million now. That's insane. Uh, 97 million almost. If some of y'all want to go check it out, gang, fuck with me and get me over the line here. Look up populations of countries right now. I want to see what country, <laughs> what country is listening. To, what country could have entirely listened to it? Yeah, what country could have everybody Let's get there one would down know. really quick. I think when I looked at it recently, it's like one third of the American population. Yeah, that's probably about right. Let's go to, just can you go down? Is there a list? Is there a chart? There we go. Get that chart. Let me zoom in a little bit, Daddy. Let's look at 100 million right there. 98. There we go. Vietnam. Holy shit. Vietnam, baby. We're close to touching Egypt, dude. I need to get to the Egypt mark. (sighs) You close, baby. That would be fire, dude. They could have been over there fucking mummies and shit banging. Save me. The Philippines, they want if once you hit Philippines, baby, that yeah. is mad. It's crazy dude. that it's more than the United Kingdom. That's nuts. That's a mad. Yeah, I never thought about it like that. I think about it from like football fields. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like that's how I just like categorize things to me. Is you know how many people, how many nights could I sell out a football field if at that rate? You know what I'm saying? It was like thirty nights or something. And now y'all are playing bigger venues. Now you're touring. Yeah, you're I'm touring, touring with Shine Down later this year. Tickets actually go on sale. They should be on sale by the time y'all see this. Tickets are on sale. Jelly Roll, Shine Down, the fucking, they've had more number ones than any rock band in history. Wow. I can't believe I'm going out with them. It's surreal. That's amazing, bro. It's just bro. fucking awesome. So I'm going out with Shine Down later this year. I got a bunch of headline dates. JellyRoll615.com. You want to come see me? Sure, use the support. And uh, we're playing a lot of wow. festivals, dude. Amazing. That's going to be yep. a blast, bro. People are going to love it. I got a big announcement coming for Nashville in a few weeks. I got to figure out, but you know it. But I got to, it's, for a mayor for everywhere yeah for sure not just for nashville no 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 i'm saying you know they're out now but i'm saying we're gonna announce our nashville show oh you have a big announcement about that big announcement about the nashville show coming up it'll be it's going to be insane it's never thought this ain't even something i want to say i dreamed about this Nah, didn't think it'd ever happen. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Fucking. <laughs> didn't even dream about it, baby. Yeah. I'll tell you what I dreamed. What was that song that Bon Jovi sang one of their hits, Tim, who's in here? We've been fighting this all day, Bizzle. We can't remember the Bon Jovi. I had hours to think about it even after. And fuck. We both lie silently <laughs> still. Is that Bon Jovi? In the dead. Uh, poison. Okay, not uh, them. Uh, 
who was it? Damn. Uh, Bad medicine? No. Look, you look at Bond. No, it was before that. Let's sing a song for the. Oh, I don't think that was it. Uh, Johnny work, Johnny working down in the dark, working for a man. He keeps for his life. Oh, love. Ooh. Yes. Living on a prayer. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. that's Aerosmith redid. No, that's that's, uh, living on the edge. that's living on the edge, baby. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Fuck weed. <laughs> no, now I'm saying living on a prayer like living on the edge. Li- living on no, that's that's living on the edge again. Living on a prayer. Shoot me. Johnny, use your work on the dime. You got to hold on to what we got. It doesn't make a difference if you make it or not. Yes, yes, yes. And the road, my, my, uh, my uh, babysitter. We're halfway. My babysitter played that. It was the first song I ever remember hearing. Living on a prayer. Yes. Because I heard it with a woman. I heard it with a chick, and I thought she was cute. And so in my mind, it, that that made enough glue. Yeah. And so, dude, I kept when we were in her car. Oh, you were I, living on a prayer back oh, then, bro, too, baby. I kept saying, hey, let me put your seatbelt on for you again. <laughs> and I was just, bro, we'd be driving. I put her seatbelt on 30 times, just rubbing my hand across her chest, dude. Then hopping behind my buddy's map in the back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all were sharing the maps together, yeah, dude. dude. Oh, awesome. man. We're both headed the same direction, eh? Uh, Jelly Roll, thank you so much. Thank uh, you, we'll put the information where people can come check you out. When does the tour start? Do you know? Uh, I head out at the end of this month to do the East Coast run. I think those are all sold out, but the Big Shine Down tour starts in the fall. I got some dates getting announced with a couple other guys that are big friends of mine. I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about it, but I will because I don't care. I'm going out and do some shows with Co Wetzel, our boy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm doing I some Co Wetzel shows. Here. Me and Co Wetzel got a song coming out later uh, that's really dope um, called Role Model, aka the Cocaine Song. And. Um, yeah, I got some shit cooking, man. It's going to be a big year for me, dude. I'm, it's it's uh, surreal. We're like doing full amphitheaters all year. It's wow. crazy. Dude, that's amazing, man. Red Rocks. Red Rocks is on sale right now. Is there's only really? a couple thousand tickets left. We went on sale a few days ago, and there's like 1,700 tickets left. I would be, I would cry if I could hurry up and sell them just to have the peace to know I sold out the fucking top two most legendary venues in America. That'd be fascinating, man. Yeah, Coe's unbelievable. Coe is just a, I mean, he's that, he's a. He's that fuck you Texas rock yeah. country southern. He's like me. You can't really label what he does anything. It's just different, you know? Yeah. He's he so is, good. Uh, he is, what is the word I'm looking for? It's, he's a rebel. Yeah, no, for sure, dude. He's, it's polarizing. He's a rebel man. Yeah, he's a rebel man, dude. He's like he's like me. He does not give a fuck. He's yeah. one of my favorite people in music. Well, fuck him, and we'd be happy to have him in here sometime. Um, but, uh, <laughs> fuck you, but come no, on. Cole, we'll have to have him in here sometime. Jelly Roll, thank you so much, man, and congratulations on all this success. And just thanks for sharing your story, man. Uh, I can relate to certain chapters of it, and um, yeah, it just seems. Uh, it seems like you, what you're creating is just part of your life, man. It's cool to see. Thank you for watching, bro. Thank you for having me. I love you, man. It means the world. Yeah, I love you too. Bizzle Gibbons, tour manager, thanks for stopping in. Riley Mao peeked in before we had to go to, I'm sure, some type of church meetup. Yeah, for and, sure. And uh, Nilo sat in today to help produce. So thank you guys so much, gang. Gang. Gang, gang. Now I'm just floating on the breeze And I feel I'm falling like these leaves I must be cornerstone Oh, but when I reach that ground I'll share this peace of mind I found I can feel it in my bones But it's gonna take a little time for me to set that parking brake and let myself all mine shine that light on Runaway train
came with a heavy load of mine. 